to our Tuesday, February 8th, 2022 Board of Supervisors meeting. We're thankful you're all here today, a great turnout. And we'll start, uh, as we do every meeting, with the Pledge of Allegiance led by Supervisor Wygant. Thank you, and now we will go to our consent agenda, and I understand staff has an item that they need to pull from our consent calendar. Yes, Chair, we're requesting the, that item 19B be removed from the consent calendar, and it will come back at a future date. Okay, so we have 19B that will come back at a future date. Do we have any other items that board members would like or staff would like to? address okay not seeing any is there any public items any public comment and any of our consent calendar items we're not seeing any comment there so I'd entertain a motion to approve the remaining items excluding thank you okay we have a motion Holmes second four all those in favor roll, oh, roll call I apologize my coaches are right down in front, so you'll hear them prompting me often. Gore? Aye. Wygant? Yes. Holmes? Aye. Jones? Aye. Gustafson? Aye. Thank you. And now's our time for public comment. This is a time on our item, on our agenda, where we are willing to take and listen to public comments up to three minutes per person. And if uh, comments can't be heard within uh, 15 or 20 minutes, then we're gonna move uh, the rest of public comment to the end of the session. These are for items that are not elsewhere on our agenda. So if you will um, confine your comments to those and then we will take public comment on each item that's on the agenda. So with that, do we have public comment? Uh, good morning, supervisors. So my name is Tim Woodall. Uh, I am speaking to you this morning on behalf of Protect American River Canyons, or PARC. Uh, I serve as the board president of that organization. By the way, we're celebrating uh, 50 years of work to protect the natural, cultural, and recreational resources of the north and middle forks of the American rivers and their canyons uh, this year. So uh, been around a long time, doing a lot of good work. I'm here this morning uh, to extend a thank you to each and every one of you and to Placer County in general for your leadership and your support of Park's proposal to get the wreckage of the old Highway 49 bridge out of the river down near the confluence in Auburn State Recreation Area. Uh, we've been working on this project uh, a little more than a year, a little more than a year ago, we actually came to Supervisor Gustafson and she was very interested in what we had to say, very interested in this project and uh, took action to, uh, to move this project along, helping uh, getting uh, Senator uh, Brian Dolly and uh, Assembly Members Bigelow and Dolly engaged on this project. There was an effort last year to try to get some funding for this project uh, in last year's or the current year's state budget. Uh, Caltrans showed some reluctance to engage. We weren't successful last year. And to this county's credit, you guys have stepped up now and taken the lead on the project, specifically, again, Supervisor Gustafson and your Public Works Department. And I just want to uh, personally thank you, Supervisor Gustafson, for your leadership on this. And I also want to recognize some of the people in your, uh, uh, in Placer County that are working hard on this. Uh, Ken Grimm, Public Works Director. Plenty of stuff on his plate already, but he, uh, very generously said, yeah, we can take this project on. It's challenging, it's complicated, but it's also interesting and, we, and, and important, and uh, we want to do it. So thank you to Mr. Grimm for his, his engagement on this. I also want to rec recognize uh, senior engineer Kevin Nordway, who's uh, kind of the brains trying to figure out, uh, again, how to get all this, this uh, heavy concrete and metal wreckage out of the river. It's, uh, it's a complicated project, not easy. Kevin Ordway is leading the way in that regard. And finally, I also want to recognize uh, 
your uh, Joel Joyce, your legislative uh, and governmental affairs coordinator, who is working hard in Sacramento to try to get funding in this coming year's uh, fiscal year's budget uh, to fund that removal project. Uh, uh, with all these good folks working on it, we're optimistic we're going to get it done this year and we'll be back later hopefully to celebrate the fact that we now have funding and Placer County can move, move forward on getting that dangerous metal and, and concrete out of the river and, and uh, restore an otherwise beautiful place to what it should be. So thank you for your time and uh, have a great day. Hey Tim, let me just say that all of the names that you mentioned that you're thanking we all get paid to do what you do, we do. You all have volunteered a huge amount of time to make this project happen, so kudos to you for bringing it forward. Great, well thank you mm -hmm. for that. Okay, thanks. Okay, other public comment. We always welcome compliments, but we'll take any public comments, so. <laughs> Good morning. This won't be a compliment, sorry. That's okay. My name is Vernon Barnes. I live 1480 Dusty Road in Colfax, California. I'm here today because we, the citizens of the Cape Horn area of Colfax, can no longer wait for Placer County Code Enforcement, Environmental Health, the Sheriff's Department, or even CAL FIRE to address the problems with several properties in our area. Today I am specifically here to address the most urgent of these on Dusty Road, APN 099-191-051-00. Myself, as well as at least six other property owners, have filed complaint after complaint uh, with code enforcement beginning in May, on May 1st of 2021. Uh, code enforcement has been dragging their feet. Okay, now three weeks ago, we looked out of our front porch to witness this, a fire on that property. Now there's several squatters living there. The sheriff has been there several times. Here's a daytime picture. This is what we believe to be I'm saying believed to be because no one will investigate it, a meth lab that burned. Um, here's some pictures, if you guys want them, I have several of campfires, uh, cooking, garbage sprued as far as you can see it, open gasoline containers, dripping gasoline out on the ground, as well as other chemicals, uh, and more garbage. Now this is 120 acres that's now covered in this, okay? This huge fire on the property covered all these kind of encampments and flammables and as far as the eye could see garbage. Uh, empty food containers, empty alcohol containers, and a ton of abandoned vehicles, meth pipes, all this kind of stuff. Now there's children in the neighborhood, of course, playing around this stuff. We in the community have done our, our best to try to do something about it. After info informing code enforcement official of the fire, they said they came out and found nobody and said a hearing had been scheduled for March 16th of 2022 for the matter. We may all be dead before then. We have one road in, one road out. We discussed this three years ago. Nobody has done a thing since. Uh, are we just gonna wait until we're dead to do something about this? Uh, this is something that needs to be addressed immediately, not March 16th. We're already 10 months into this and nothing has been done. We're also above the American River where they're dumping all this stuff that's running down the hill into the North Fork of the American River. I, also, with regards to getting the information, it, we've been working on this for three months. This is public information, and county staff has been trickling this information to us from November till now, 
over 500 pages, and I'm, I'm understanding that there's even more. And all I can understand is, is that county staff is withholding this and just trickling out after they delete things and after they do whatever. It shouldn't take three months to do this. I don't care if people are working from home, what's going on. Anyway, I'm begging this staff, this board, to please do something about this now or our blood will be on all your hands. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Barnes. Other public comment? Stephen Gilbert. Uh, I second everything he says. Uh, and I'll just read this to you. Do you understand about the Board of Forestry voting about anybody that has one way into their property and if their house burns down, they are not allowed to build there again? Are you aware of that? It's going to be happening in Sacramento. Okay, so that affects everyone that lives in that kind of an area. Or a tight turn, you can't rebuild. If you share a driveway with somebody, you can't rebuild. That's coming up for a vote. I have a 45-day notice on it, but anyway. Uh, I've been dealing with the County Planning Commission for some time. Uh, you guys have seen some of this stuff before and voted on it, not personally you know, this been before the board, and it's just gone on. We need a little enforcement. We need to, if, I mean, I'm doing what I can personally to stop what I can. And the only thing I run into is the law going, you know, we can't do anything about it. Don't get yourself in trouble. I'm like, I'm willing, you know. If you want to put me away and feed me for the rest of my life, okay. Take care of my medical, that's fine. I'm not doing this for me. I'm doing this because somebody needs to do it. And just, you can come look at any of my paperwork. I've got paperwork, I, you know. Uh, I believe I get 10 days if I ask for a piece of paper. 10 days is supposed to be given to me. I have repeated requests from November 15th, the day I was not notified of things, and went down there and said, whoa, 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 you know, hey, what's going on with this? Well, it's going to pass. And I said, no, it's not. I'm going to be here to stop it. And I've been there. And finally, someone started to. And he'll be here at 10.30, and I'll address him then, you know. And I'd like you guys to uh, hear our complaints in the future, and we can put it up to the board and like stuff on the record so it just doesn't go away, you know. And I'm basically standing up for what you guys already voted for. You know, nobody's enforcing it, nobody's doing anything about it. I haven't had any issues with the police for 22 years, and I had an issue with six of them in four days because of this, you know. I haven't ever called them. Don't need it, you know. Yeah, it's civil, it's whatever. But nobody can do anything. So they can burn down every one of our places, and no one, we can't, you can't even tell somebody to get off property if they don't belong there. I can. I'm a citizen. I can. And I will. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Good morning, Board of Supervisors. My name is Jason Wedge. And um, so last week I kind of spoke, um, when you guys were up in Tahoe, just the importance of prayer and everything. And that's something that I feel is important to bring into these meetings and all county meetings. So um, I just drove in real quick, so didn't have anything prepared. So I just want to open you guys up in a quick prayer this morning, if you guys don't mind. So, so Father, we just thank you for this meeting. And Lord, we just invite your presence into this room today. And just move on the hearts of these board members today. Lord, just give them the wisdom and the directions that they need to represent we the people. We thank you for the job that they're doing, and we thank you for the job that they're going to continue to do. So, Lord, so we just thank you in advance for what you're going to accomplish here in this meeting today. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you.
Thank you for that guidance. Distinguished board members, Madam Chair, good morning. My name is Tony Karwowski. I'm the newly appointed CEO and President of the North Lake Tahoe Resort Association. And this is the first convening of the board since I've been appointed, so I wanted to come down and introduce myself and say hello. Um, we at the North Lake Tahoe Resort Association are undergoing a transition, as you know, from a destination marketing organization, solely focused on visitors, visitorship, visitation, and attracting, to a destination stewardship organization, which is focusing on surfacing the issues in our community, convening key stakeholders of the community, including the CEO's office and yourselves and many other organizations in our region to surface the issues and then provide forum for discussion and ultimately problem solving through some of the key tools that we've developed over the years. It's an exciting time for me to be there and I, I couldn't really be more hopeful for our future in building a collaborative environment for us to come together and build North Lake Tahoe into what it truly can be in the future. Our TOT funds that are existing now are going to come to transition into um, opportunities to solve for transit and housing issues in our region, which are our two biggest issues that we face. Our Tourism Business Improvement District dollars are going to fund our operations for the North Lake Tahoe Resort Association, including marketing and sales, as well as giving us the opportunity to include in that tourism impact mitigation, sustainability efforts, and programming. Truly exciting impacts on our community. I go back to collaboration and want to also acknowledge the CEO's office on day one of my first day in the office. They dropped a congratulations to me and offered a handshake and partnership to move forward with in the future. We have a steep and deep history together in working to make our community the best it can possibly be. I look forward to building on that through all the tools mentioned to ensure a stable and robust economy for North Lake Tahoe. To address environmental sustainability in practices and policies and to ensure an incredibly healthy and thriving community for visitors and residents alike as we move forward. Thank you for your time today. Hey, Tony, before you leave, yes. do you mind giving the rest of the board a bit of your background? Since I know you, you don't have to. I certainly will, yeah. Supervisor. Thank you. So I have been a resident in North Lake Tahoe for 20 years. I've worked in the recreation industry, including ski resorts, for a career-long 29 years. Um, a lot of that in the 20 years that have existed uh, in the major resorts. Um, my most recent role was at North Star California Resort as the director of base area operations and village and sat on the leadership team, the senior leadership team of that organization for five years. Um, and as well, I've had the fortune of in that role participating in um, some community boards, including the Truckee Tahoe Transportation Management Association, where I was secretary of the board for three years, as well as the former CIT committee. Um, from the North Lake Tower Resort Association. So thank you for that opportunity. Sure, thank you, Tony. Any other public comment in the room? Okay, I believe we have at least one on Zoom. Mm -hmm. Nanette, please unmute your mic and give your comments. Hi, yes, thank you. Can you hear me okay? Yes, we can. <clears throat> Hi, good morning. Um, I've been a resident of Placer County for the last 31 years, and this is what I've seen happen. In the midst of a pandemic, businesses are struggling. People are having a difficult time putting gas in their vehicles and food on their table. Here is what you, the Placer County Board of Supervisors, has done to Placer County and how you have conducted yourselves within the last two and a half years, with the exception of Suzanne Jones. You destroyed the district attorney's office in 2020. As of today, at least 30 employees have quit or retired due to the terrible working conditions within that office. Most of which that quit or retired were long-term experienced litigating attorneys. That office is currently struggling to hire employees and cannot retain the ones they finally do hire. In 2019, you gave an unheard of 28% pay increase to Supervisor Euler's wife, 
which still to this day, there has been no accountability by this board. You essentially defunded the Sheriff's Department by repealing Measure F in the midst of a war on law enforcement and most importantly against the voters will, leaving the Sheriff's Department unable to maintain or recruit quality deputy sheriffs. You have disrespected the voters and all deputy sheriffs of Placer County, leading yet to another lawsuit against Placer County. You accept blood money from the federal government with clear strings attached, such as Project Room Key, and then authorize spending $17 million on a homeless haven in the heart of the Roseville Commerce Center. This board has stated several times there is no mandates in Placer County, yet I have seen with my own eyes an email from a county department manager stating that Placer County employees must wear a mask as it's a county and state mandate. Additionally, asking employees to essentially tattle on coworkers for not following the guidelines. Either you have zero clue as to what your department heads are engaging in, or they just ignore you like you do us. Either way, county leadership is severely lacking. This county chooses to remain uninformed after we have made several attempts to give you information and requested multiple times that you look into all of it. Either you know exactly what's going on in this country and the destruction of our counties by way of installing Soros DAs and weak sheriffs and choose to turn a blind eye, or you are so wrapped up in yourselves you cannot see past the dollar signs. Turning a blind eye to misconduct, deceptive behavior, and knowingly ignoring corruption is in fact engaging in corruption. I'm just a bit perturbed at the fact that you, the Board of Supervisors, decided that it's a good idea to give yourselves a raise in the midst of all this turmoil. I think instead of a right raise, it's time for replacements on that board with people that will work for the people and not for themselves. Again, we choose freedom over financial gain. Thank you. Thank you. Chair, I see no further comments. Okay, so we'll close public comments and go to board member and county executive reports. I know our county CEO is Zooming in today. Uh, I don't know if he has any reports, but board members, while we're waiting, do any reports? Suzanne? Jim? Okay, we'll go to Todd for county CEO reports. Hey, good morning. Uh, good to see you from a distance. Um, good morning. Um, I don't have any uh, reports per se. I know we have a number of topics today that we're working on. so. I just uh, looking forward to the conversation. Thank you. Okay, thank you. And again, not seeing other reports. Uh, we have a 930 timed item, but ahead of that, uh, we'll go ahead to department item eight, facilities management. And Charlie, is he zooming in for us today, Megan? Yes. Okay, great, Charlie. Welcome and please go ahead and present. Good morning, Chair of the Board, uh, Board Member uh, Gustafson and, and Supervisors. I'm Charlie Fraley, a Senior Project Manager with Facilities Management. I present to you the following request. Approve plans and specifications and authorize staff to solicit bids to the, for the Placer County Government Center Building 208, 209, and 210, otherwise known as Building 210, um, re-roof and HVAC project located at 11476 C Avenue, Auburn, with an estimated construction cost of $2,217,500, and also authorize the Director of Facilities Management or designee to award and execute a construction contract not to exceed $2,100,000 upon concurrent, uh, 200, uh, sorry, $2,100,000 upon concurrence of County Council and Risk Management, and delegate authority to approve any necessary change orders not to exceed $117,500, consistent with County Purchasing Manual in Section 20142 of the Public Contract Code. A little background on this building. Uh, the 
the Placer County Government Center Building 210 roof is at the end of its useful life cycle of more than 30 years and has been identified for replacement by the VFA building management software. The roof has been patched in numerous locations. However, water intrusion issues continue to persist and adequate draining during weather events is an issue. The design presented will add an estimated 20 plus years for the roof's life cycle and, addresses, and address issues such as poor drainage and dry rot. Approximately 23 rooftop HVAC units <clears throat> are also identified by VFA to be replaced at this time, all exceeding their useful life cycle of 15 years. It is in the county's best economic interest to, for, to replace these now in order to save substantial maintenance and construction costs in the future. The buildings identified <clears throat> needing this preventative maintenance are tentatively scheduled for demolition in phase two of the Placer County Government Center Master Plan. The departments that are located in buildings 208, 209, and 210 are facilities management, information technology, and museums, <clears throat> and have been notified of the upcoming replacements. And with that, I'll take any of your questions. Thank you, Charlie. Do we have any questions for Charlie? Yes, go ahead, uh, Supervisor quick question, Gore. Charlie. So phase two demolition, when do we anticipate that happening? How many uh, years it, out? Yep, I'll have to get back to you on the exact timing of that um, and, and look at the master plan. Uh, I want to say it was exceeding 15 to 20 years. And, and that's what I wanted to know because when you say that the, the roof is going to last 20 years and if we were going to demo those in three years, I'd have a problem with that. <laughs> <laughs> so if it's, you know, 15 years from now, then that makes sense. So I appreciate that. Thank you. Yes. Any other questions? Okay, any public comment on this item? Ah, well, that was perfect timing. <laughs> that was perfect timing. We have a service dog in training. For those of you who couldn't hear that, we have a service dog in training in the uh, chambers here with us. So he spoke up. She spoke up. Okay, with that, I'd entertain a motion. Motion Wygant, second Holmes. All those in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Any abstentions? Okay. Thank you, Charlie. Thank you. I've still got two minutes. So we will go to item number nine, Health and Human Services. Amy, are you with us? Yes, I'm here. Good morning, Chair Gustafson and members of the board. Today, my action item is to request your board to approve an agreement with WellSpace Health Incorporated for substance use treatment services from January 1st, 2022 through June 30th, 2023 in an amount not to exceed $2,520,534 and authorize the Director of Health and Human Services to sign the agreement and to sign, uh, sign subsequent amendments up to $100,000 consistent with the agreement's current subject matter and scope of work with risk management and county council concurrence. Placer County is a participant in the 1115 Bridge to Reform Demonstration Waiver for Substance Use Disorder Services. The Drug Medi-Cal Organized Delivery System is a program designed to organize the delivery of healthcare services for Medi-Cal eligible individuals with substance use disorders. We have been a participant since November 1st, 2018. Our responsibility is to provide medically necessary substance use disorder treatment in a timely manner. In order to accomplish this, we seek to expand our network of quality providers. WellSpace Health Incorporated has provided effective treatment in Sacramento since 1953. They offer an array of substance use disorder services, health and mental health care. Placer will contract with their SUD residential treatment program to ensure timely access to quality care for Placer beneficiaries who need this level of service as determined by the American Society of Addiction Medicine, or we call it ASAM, criteria for substance use disorder treatment services. Placer's substance use disorder contract providers are a vital part of the continuum of care necessary to provide mandated substance use treatment. Levels of care available in Placer County through various contract providers are medication assisted treatment, withdrawal management, otherwise known as detox, residential, outpatient to adults and adolescents, 
recovery residences combined with outpatient treatment. Our, con our contracts demonstrate Placer County's continued emphasis on collaboration with criminal justice partners, human services, mental health, and children's system of care to leverage available funding and provide the most cost-effective and appropriate care to those headed for or already within our systems. Placer County's partnerships and community providers work together to achieve recovery. Funding for, funding for these mandated services is comprised 100% of federal and state sources. Funding is included in the department's fiscal year 21-22 budget and will be included in our next year's budget as well. And I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much, Amy. Uh, do we have any questions for Amy on this item? Okay, any public comment on this item? I'd entertain a motion. Motion Holmes, second Gore. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Any abstentions? Seeing none. <laughs> Item is passed. Thank you. Thank you, Amy. Okay, so it's past 9.30, and if uh, we can go back to our 9.30 time item now. Um, and this is a proclamation uh, for the Placer County Grand Jury on Grand Jury Awareness Month. Um, and I believe we have some representatives who would like to address the item, and then I can read the proclamation into the public record. I think Karen is here, no? Karen and Alan? Don't be shy. Well, good morning, board. Uh, I'm Al Whitman. I represent the Placer County Grand Jurors Association as being a past member of the Grand Jury 2009-2010. We're here uh, to uh, ask for a proclamation recognizing that February is Grand Jury Awareness Month. Um, does that work? Yes. Good morning. My name is Lorena Sims. I'm the foreperson of the current Placer County Grand Jury. On behalf of the 19 members of the jury, 10 of whom are here at, uh, at present. Let's recognize <laughs> them all. Please stand up. I would like to say I very much appreciate your recognition of our hard work and also appreciate how very much uh, support we have seen from the county. Uh, not all counties give give their grand juries as much support as Placer County does, and we are appreciative. Thank you. Well, thank you, and thank all of you. And I'm going to read um, the proclamation into the record. In the matter of a proclamation recognizing February 2022 as Grand Jury Awareness Month in Placer County, Whereas every year in each of California's 58 counties, 19 ordinary citizens take an oath. I don't know that you're ordinary, by the way, um, because you've stepped forward to serve, and that's a great effort on your part, but that's my side comment. That isn't in the proclamation. Um, take an oath to voluntarily serve a term of one year as grand jurors and whereas grand juries have been in existence since the adoption of California's original constitution in 1849 through 1850, and whereas grand juries conduct their investigations under the auspices of the Superior Court of California and have broad access to public officials, employees, records, and information. One of the most important functions of a grand jury is to review the operations of the officers, department, and agencies of local government. And whereas grand juries are charged with investigating and reporting on local governmental operations to assure that their responsibilities are being fulfilled legally, efficiently, honestly, and in the best interest of the public. Grand juries serve as a watchdog authority and are well suited to the effective investigation of local governments because they are independent bodies, operationally separate from the entities and officials that they investigate. And whereas the grand jury's fact-finding efforts 
result in reports that contain specific recommendations aimed at identifying problems and offering ways to improve government operations and enhance responsiveness. And whereas the hard work done by grand juries has a great effect on our communities and makes California a better place to live. And whereas the reward of being a grand juror is the satisfaction received from working with fellow residents and community members to improve local government for all. And whereas in 2009, Governor Arnold Schwarzenegger declared February to be California Grand Jury Awareness Month, and whereas it is appropriate to recognize the efforts of those jurors, both past and present, who have volunteered their time and service to the Placer County Grand Jury. And so now, therefore, we will proclaim it once we take a vote. But first, I need to ask if there's any board member comments or public comment. Any public comment? OK, then now, therefore, be it proclaimed. Oh, I need a motion. I'm sorry. So moved. <laughs> Thank you, Second. Supervisor Wygant. Thank you, Supervisor Gore. OK, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. So now, therefore, be it proclaimed that the above proclamation was duly passed by the Board of Supervisors of the County of Placer on behalf of the citizens of Placer County at a regular meeting held February 8, 2022, proclaiming the month of February 2022 is Grand Jury Awareness Month. So I have a proclamation to present, and I'd love to have you all come up. We'll do a photo up front. I think we have... Yes, I'll. and who would you like to accept it on your behalf? A fourth person would be an okay. appropriate person. And the puppy. And the puppy. And, and if we hold our breath, we can take our masks off really quick. Okay. Okay. Right here. Like yeah. Sure, yes, yes, of course. I'm always in the back row. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I really appreciate it. We all appreciate your service. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. You have a good day. You too. I know, cute puppy. What was the puppy's name again? Her Lupin. Lupin, that was right. Steals the show. Okay, with that, thank you again very much. We'll move on to our 940 timed item, ordinance to reauthorize transient occupancy tax. And I believe Stephanie Holloway and Lindsay Romack are here. Good morning, Chairwoman Gustafson, members of the board, Stephanie Holloway with your Tahoe CEO's office. Um, excited to be here this morning to talk to you about the ordinance, introduction of an ordinance on the 2% uh, TOT uh, that is up for uh, potential renewal this year. So just wanted to open the item, hand it over to Lindsay here in a minute, but I wanted to highlight just the long history of TOT in the county and specifically in Eastern Placer over the last uh, 28 years. Um, you know, TOT has really facilitated a number of community-led infrastructure projects, um, you know, really supporting the tourism master plan in Eastern Placer as, whether, as well as some other guiding, guiding documents um, that have uh, been instrumental in our community. So, um, you know, I just also wanted to highlight the importance of TOT as it relates to the North Lake Tahoe Resort Association. You heard from Tony this morning. and. Um, you know, really um, bringing forward a lot of um, partnership there, supporting their organization over the years, and now with a, a more formal T-bid in place, um, we're looking forward to continuing that partnership with them. So I think Tony may be here to provide a couple more comments for their, their organization, but 
Um, you know, I'm going to hand this over to Lindsay. She's just been instrumental in bringing this forward to the community over the last couple of months um, and to your board here this morning. So I wanted to give her a shout out and hand it over. Thank you very much, Stephanie. As she said, I'm Lindsay Romack with the County Executive Office in Tahoe and excited uh, today to discuss this ordinance to reauthorize the 2% transient occupancy tax in North Lake Tahoe. So what is TOT? I know your board is very familiar, but to ensure everyone is on the same page, uh, TOT stands for Transient Occupancy Tax. Uh, transient are overnight visitors. So this is a tax that is paid uh, for those folks that stay overnight. So this includes those that stay in both hotels and short-term rentals. So a little bit of history on the TOT. Um, as your board is familiar, there is a 8% TOT charged in unincorporated Placer County throughout the entire county. In 1996, the voters in North Lake Tahoe voted to approve an additional 2%, bringing the total uh, TOT in North Lake Tahoe to 10%. That was up for a vote in 2002. It was uh, renewed and then renewed again in 2012. And as Stephanie just mentioned, uh, the voters that renewed it in 2012 voted to extend it through September of 2022. So that's why we are here before you now. And I just wanted to make mention that currently in 2022, uh, this 2% additional TOT generates about $4 million per year. So as Stephanie also mentioned, the TOT is a very important uh, funding source to the North Lake Tahoe community. And I should mention, you'll notice there are some pictures on these slides. These are all projects that have received uh, TOT funding. So this is the famous Penny Bear uh, in Tahoe City, which has become a... Uh, a big picture spot, you'll see it all over Instagram. Um, but not just Penny Bear, there have been numerous projects in the more than a quarter century that this 2% has been in place. Um, more than $45 million has gone to local projects. And that funding has also leveraged additional funding for the North Lake Tahoe area, uh, bringing in more than 300 million in additional state, federal, and local sources. So as we mentioned, it's helped fund a lot of uh, projects. Uh, they touch many different aspects of the community, including public beach and park enhancements, uh, trails that has been a, a big thing for the community, traffic congestion management, litter removal, and much, much more. So knowing that this 2% uh, TOT would be up for potential renewal this year, uh, the county worked with uh, consultants Lou Edwards and FM3 last summer to conduct a community survey to better understand some of the important issues to the community and to see uh, what sort of support there would be out there for continuing this measure. Uh, so just two survey highlights we thought we wanted to share with you included 71% um, of those survey felt that North Lake Tahoe had a great or some need for additional funding. And 81% of those surveyed uh, had initial support for continuing the TOT measure. And I will say this community survey was conducted of North Lake Tahoe voters, which would be the ones who would vote on this potential ballot measure as well. So today we are before you, and we'll get to the next step with um, the actual action for your board, uh, but if your board does decide to move forward with this ordinance uh, to reauthorize the 2% pending approval on a vote in June, um, then we will return to your board um, on 222, which I thought was very appropriate since it's the 2% on February 2nd, or February 22nd, 2022. Um, so we'll come back um, with action, asking for action to adopt the ordinance and also adopt a resolution. The resolution would then place a measure on the ballot on June 7th, 2022, and the voters of North Lake Tahoe would then decide if they'd like to continue this. And if it is approved by a majority of voters, then the 2% uh, would remain in place. So now the requested action. Today we are here to conduct a public hearing uh, on the TOT of 2% for a total of 10% in the North Lake Tahoe area, and then asking for action to introduce and waive oral reading of an ordinance to amend Placer County Code Section 4.16.030B uh, operative upon a majority vote held on June 7th. So with that, I am happy to take uh, any questions from your board. Great. Any questions, board members? 
Great, thank you, Lindsay. And so we're opening up a public hearing now on this item. Uh, any public comment uh, we're happy to take. I know, Tony, you wanted to speak to this, and there might be callers on Zoom as well. Certainly. Hello again, board members. Um, we were introduced back during public comment. Tony Karowski, CEO, uh, North Lake Tower Resort Association, uh, speaking uh, in support of renewal of this 2% TOT funding. Um, I thank you to both Stephanie and Lindsay for putting together the PowerPoint today and, and really putting together um, a case that is, makes sense for our region that demonstrates the needs and the resources that we need in order to um, problem solve for our region. I would also say that as we move towards, uh, as the NLTRA moves towards Tourism Business Improvement District funding, that will relieve some of these funds from operations funds to problem solving funds. They'll move into uh, funds that are available for housing issues and transit issues in our community, which again are two of the biggest issues that we face right now. So these funds are crucial for that. So I thank you, I thank staff again, um, to move forward with an ordinance to reauthorize the 2% TOT and move to eventually get it on ballot for June 7th. Thank you. Thank you. And we have callers on Zoom. Justin, please unmute your mic and give your comments. Thank you. Hopefully you can all hear me well. Thank you, Chair Gustafson, and good morning, Supervisors. Justin Brolio, Public Information Officer for the North Tahoe Public Utility District, for the record. Um, on behalf of the North Tahoe Public Utility District, um, I'd like to thank the Board of Supervisors for considering this ordinance to reauthorize the additional 2% TOT tax in our area here in North Lake Tahoe. As a recipient, of grant funding awarded through the tourism master plan grant process supported by the additional 2%. The district has been able to complete a variety of projects that have made a real meaningful impact throughout our community here in North Lake Tahoe. Matched with our long-term capital improvement plan budget and other grant funding, this funding from Placer County specifically has allowed us to implement projects that have increased parking and public access to the lake We've built new recreation trails, installed trail signage that has both oriented and educated visitors and residents. We've improved ADA access to our facilities. And most recently, in partnership with Tahoe City Public Utility District, we've been able to launch a long-term active recreation planning study to meet the needs of our community and our changing and growing community. And that has seen an involvement of over 600 community members so far. So North Tower PUD encourages the county's continued use of the additional 2% TOT funding for infrastructure projects that allow us to enhance the quality of life of our community, as well as enhance the visitor and resident experience as they um, recreate and explore North Lake Tahoe. So thank you for your time. Thank you, Justin. Caroline, please unmute your mic and give your comments. Good morning, and uh, Board of Supervisors. Um, thank you for bringing this up, but um, I just wanted to mention, um, and I will raise my questions to Stephanie and Lindsay. So I have been a, a homeowner in um, the Olympic Valley um, since 2003. And so when we became, uh, when we started renting out our condo, um, we started paying 10% to Placer County, and then additionally 1% for the Mountaineer. Um, and 2% and goes to civic fees, which we submit to um, Squaw Valley. Um, I have been listening to a lot of um, your residents, and um, we don't mind paying a fair share, but I hope that you will actually um, start looking at these big companies and make sure that Altera is paying their fair share. You know, what have they contributed to uh, workforce housing? They have been promising this since KSL took over IntraWest. And now we have Altera who uh, brags actually about millions of dollars that they spent on marketing. We have talked about over tourism 
And so I hope that you will hold these big corporations accountable and, and demand that they pay their fair share. Thank you. Thank you, Caroline. Chair, I see no further comments. Any other comments on this item in the public? Okay, then we'll close the public hearing and we'll consider a motion to introduce and waive the oral reading of this ordinance. We have a motion, Wygant, second Jones. Okay, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you. Thank you. Great job. Okay, we'll move back to department items now because our next timed item is a few minutes away. We will go to item, I guess that's 9B. And Greg Geisler is going to present this item for Health and Human Services. Thank you. Good morning, board members. Greg Geisler, Plasco County Health and Human Services Deputy Director for the Human Services Division. And I am before the board today to request two actions. First, to ratify signing and submittal of the director's certification, the revenue allocation agreement with the California Department of Social Services for the housing support program from July 1st, 2021 to June 30th, 2024 in the amount of $1,599,627 and authorize the Director of Health and Human Services to sign subsequent amendments up to $100,000 consistent with the subject matter and scope of work with risk management and County Council concurrence. And second, approve budget amendment number AM00604 in the amount of $734,000 $382 for fiscal year 2021-22 for the receipt of the additional housing support program allocation. A little context uh, regarding the program. Since 2015, the CalWORKs housing support program has allowed CalWORKs families meeting certain criteria and at risk of homelessness to receive rental support before becoming unsheltered through the rapid rehousing model enabling them to quickly obtain permanent housing and achieve self-sufficiency. Over 235 families have been housed through, housed through the HSP program in Placer County. There are currently 10 families housed, including 18 children housed through the program. With this additional funds from the California Department of Social Services and with the ability, uh, and with the ability to assist CalWORKs families, Housing Support Program expects to serve over 230 families between 2021 and 2024 through the contact, contracts with our community partners, AMI Housing, Volunteers of America, and Stand Up Placer, who administer the programs. Fiscal impact. The agreement is funded with federal and state dollars, and there is no there's no uh, general fund match required. And if there is any uh, questions, I'm happy to answer. Thank you very much, Greg. Appreciate it. Any questions, board members? Not seeing any. Any public comment on this item? Any on Zoom? OK. I'd entertain a motion. OK. I have a motion from Supervisor Holmes and a second from Wygant. All those in favor? Roll oh, roll call. I am so sorry. Gosh, just let me read. I'll get there. I'm a little slow. Gore. Aye. Wygant. Yes. Holmes. Aye. Jones. Gustafson. Aye. Okay, with that, we're still ahead of 10, so we'll move on to item uh, 10. This is salary adjustments for the Board of Supervisors. Thank you. Good morning, Madam Chair and members of the board. I'm Kate Sampson with your Human Resources Department. I'm here this morning to introduce an ordinance uh, to implement salary adjustments for members of the Board of Supervisors pursuant to Placer County Charter Section 207. Uh, by way of background, 
effective in January 2015. Section 207 of the Ch county charter was amended by voters to set and limit the salaries of the Board of Supervisors. Uh, each year, we're required to calculate the average maximum salary for board members in El Dorado, Nevada, and Sacramento counties, and then set the salary for the Placer County Board of Supervisors at that level. So today, uh, the ordinance proposed uh, for your introduction will adjust salaries for the board by 1.12%. <laughs> I apologize, I can't offer you any more than that, uh, and I'm certainly available for any questions. Thank you, Kate. Any questions for Kate? Kate, I just want to make sure that, that we put on the record, you did say this was approved in our charter, the charter that the public voted on. Yes, ma'am, the, vo the voters the approved formula. the amendment to the charter yeah. in 2014, mm -hmm. and uh, as such, we were required to set salaries at the average each year. And I guess one other item for public clarification, there's no additional uh, special pays that are received uh, to serve on the Board of Supervisors. That is correct. I want it one, but it doesn't <laughs> work that way. Thank you, Kate. You're welcome. I'm sure there's public comment this morning on this item, so I'm happy to take public comment. None. Okay, none on Zoom. Okay. May I have a motion then? Second. Motion Wygant, second Holmes. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Any abstentions? Thanks, Kate. Okay, is it 10 yet? No. Okay, then we'll take just a really quick two minute break and stretch, stand up, and uh, we'll be back at 10. Quickly, Carrie, sorry to keep you waiting. Okay, we'll move to our 10 a.m. timed item now, and that is our Agricultural Commissioner and Regional Forest Health Administrator to present us this report. Thank you so much. Good morning, Chair Gustafson and board members. I'm Carrie Timmer. I am the Regional Forest Health Coordinator for the county. And I want to thank you for allowing me the time this morning to bring you up to speed, briefly update you with this informational item on how things have been going with the program for the past nine months. So um, we have been active since May 3rd, which was my first day at the county. <clears throat> Excuse me, and every day since then, uh, I have learned something new about the incredible world of forestry and wildfire prevention in, in the county. And so I'd like to give you a brief synopsis of where we stand. So just some brief background for anybody who um, is in the room or perhaps listening in who may not be familiar with the program and its beginnings. Um, forest health and wildfire risk reduction have clearly been top priorities of this board for many years. And as a reflection of that priority, last year you created this position in this program and filled it starting in May. Um, the position sits within the Agricultural Commissioner's Office and I think that's largely a recognition of the fact that we're connected to both natural resources and people and communities. So that seems like a logical place for the position to reside. And I do believe it's the first the first program of its kind at the county level, and I hope that if somebody has different information, you'll tell me so I stop saying this. <laughs> but for the time being, we do believe we are the first county with this kind of position, and either way, we do hope to be to serve as a model for other forested communities throughout California and other forested western states. Oops, I forgot I've got to do two things at once. <laughs> okay, multitasking. So, um, this is just a, uh, an explanation or illustration, rather, of the importance of this issue to your board. You have made it a top priority in your annual legislative platform for two or three years running now. Uh, and so uh, I am here basically as a result of this priority. So in recognition of the importance of forest health and wildfire issues, the county has already created quite a number of strategic plans and action plans and so forth that deal with different pieces, parts and pieces, um, from biomass to the, the um, CAL FIRE strategic fire plan to the Sierra Nevada Conservancy State of the Forests, 
Uh, and then even internally within the county, we have many plans, including um, uh, wildfire protection plans, local hazard mitigation plans, a whole biomass strategy that we believe needs to be um, a little bit refreshed and updated. Uh-oh. Um, but uh, these are all a testament to the great work that has already been going on for years and uh, that continues to be done by county departments and our partners. So really the trick now is to figure out how to knit these together. How can we collectively integrate and amplify each other's goals and more effectively coordinate activities across our different departments and partner work? And so all of this effort, of course, just to reiterate, uh, both individually and collectively, is geared toward protecting lives, property, and important resources by reducing the risk of uncharacteristically large and damaging wildfires. And let me be clear, not all wildfire is bad. We need wildfire. Our whole um, ecological system is based on it. It helps to regenerate certain plants. Um, so we're not saying that fi all fire is bad, but we have been experiencing, as you all know, these incredibly uh, damaging and uncharacteristic fires, including the first two fires in anybody's knowledge, again, that I'm aware of, that have gone up and over the Sierra Crest. We always assumed that was a natural fire break. That no longer is the assumption that we can make. So we do have an overall strategy for how to start knitting these different programs and goals together, and I think it's reflected as, as clearly as we can at the moment in this three-ringed diagram where basically the best defense is a strong offense. So that quote often gets attributed to sports figures. I think Michael Jordan, even Jack Dempsey, the boxer back in the day. But I think it actually dates back to uh, President Washington. So it seems like it's been, it's stood the test of time. And I think it's a strategy that certainly makes sense for us. So clearly, we need to protect lives and property from the dangers of these, these massive wildfires. And that's why the home hardening and defensible space activities have the central location at the center of this ring. But if we can also go on the offensive and proactively stop these uncharacteristic fires, uh, keep them from starting in the first place, or at least minimize the severity of them, then we're even more protected at all levels. So building a strong offense, then, is the work of the next two rings the wildland-urban interface, and the landscape-level restoration. So that second ring for the wildland-urban interface, or the WUI, as, as we refer to it, and that's where the residential development uh, comes right up adjacent to the forest lands. This work consists of a few different things. Um, first of all, reducing the fuel load, just minimizing the amount of fuel that exists that can, um, that can fuel these fires. Um, specifically creating fuel breaks around communities, and we'll talk in a minute about how, that, how we've seen that work in other major fires from last summer. Also, uh, this work ensures that there's sufficient access for firefighting resources, a safe place where firefighters and their equipment can gather and uh, can, can launch their offensive efforts, and protecting, of course, evacuation routes should we need to get residents or business people or recreationists out of areas where fire's occurring. And then the outside ring, the third ring, uh, is the landscape-level landscape restoration and fuel treatments. And the goal of this activity is to make forests actually more resilient so that they can withstand fire and other disturbances and not turn into these huge conflagrations. So um, to do that, we also reduce excess fuel in the forest. Um, it also provides safe staging areas for firefighting. And we also try to, um, how do I say, to decrease the density, the number of trees in a given location uh, in the hopes that the fire will not like crawl up the trees and in, get into the treetops, which is where it can really explode and really spread uh, much more quickly and much further, where sparks fly and start fires out that then merge back with the, one, with the mother fire, so to speak. And that's how these things get so big and out of control so quickly. So we saw that, uh, that we can reap benefits from this kind of restoration in fuel work uh, just last summer in the Caldor fire. So there were a couple of um, landscape level forest treatments similar to, to what we're talking about that either changed the fire behavior or provided one of these safe locations for firefighters to operate from. And in both cases um, ended up protecting specific communities. So there is proof that this activity does work and can have an impact. Not necessarily in every single case, but certainly in many cases. And anything that we can do to protect lives and property and resources 
seems to me we, sh we need to be focusing on. So just as one example, there was a project um, on Highway 50 b between Camino and Echo Summit. It was called Fire Adapted 50. It was a project led by the El Dorado and Georgetown uh, Resources Conservation District, among, among many other partners and funders. And it uh, consisted of some mechanical thinning and mastication, which is, in essence, um, a machine that grinds up the material and sort of spreads it on the ground, typically. And all of that by way of reducing the ground fuels and increasing the spacing between the trees, as we just talked about. Um, and it did indeed keep the fire from getting into the treetops where it could spread. It helped reduce the flame height, and so that the flames weren't crawling up the trees as high and therefore not getting into the treetop or the crown. Uh, and it gave uh, firefighters a place to stage their efforts that ended up specifically protecting Sly Park and Pollock Pines. So we have seen this actually work. Uh, the county already has a, a number of amazing neighborhood and community level programs in place, thanks to the Fire Safe Councils and the FireWise Communities, um, our own Resource Conservation District shipping programs, the CAL FIRE Strategic Fire Plan. Um, so we do have a number of uh, great plans in place for how to deal with that, that initial center circle. And now the county is really creating a complementary program that can help manage the forest and landscape level activities in that third ring, and then also help coordinate between, because whatever we do in one of those rings is going to affect the benefits to the other two. Um, and once again, leading us to the idea that the best defense is a good offense. So to build that, that offense, I, all these football references, I guess I got the Super Bowl on my brain, um, the Regional Forest, program, Forest Health Program has been involved in five key areas. So first is really an example of what this landscape level activity looks like, and you've heard a, a lot about this project, of course, and that's French Meadows. Um, and as it turns out, my first day coincided with basically the start of the field season for that project, so um, that became a primary effort in the initial months of my service. But um, just as a reminder for people who may not be familiar, French Meadows is a public-private partnership where the county is working with the United States Forest Service, with our partner agency, the Placer County Water Agency, also some other uh, stakeholders, including Sierra Nevada Conservancy, a state agency they are, uh, the Nature Conservancy, American River Conservancy, which are two private uh, uh, conservation kinds of organizations, and UC Merced, which is uh, conducting a bit of a um, academic exercise to look at how the impact on hydrology that these different forest treatments may have. So it's a really amazing par partnership doing great work. Uh, we've finished three field seasons and I think I will be back in front of you at another point in a couple of months where I can give you the full, um, the, the full synopsis of where we stand with that project, but just suffice it to say we're roughly halfway through. So that's the good news. Um, we have had some interesting challenges revolving mostly around uh, really extreme fire weather that obviously we've had over the past two summers that somewhat restricted the number of days that we could be out in the field working. Uh, but we are collaborating with the Forest Service and our other partners to figure out ways to address that in the coming seasons in the hopes that we can decrease the risk of our activities in terms of fire danger and therefore allow us to, to be doing more work. So that's an ongoing activity. So the next steps for that, um, uh, for that body of work really is preparing for this upcoming season, uh, seeking funds to complete the remaining work, and then identifying, identifying the next project. What do we do after French Meadows? There is life after French Meadows, I have been promised. So then the second major area that we've been working in, <coughs> excuse me, is, is really building the program itself because this is, we're sort of building it as we go, building it as we fly it, however, <laughs> however that uh, metaphor goes. So, you know, the first month again was really just getting the lay of the land and starting to um, get a better understanding of the county's goals and current activities. And then the next six months was spent primarily for me uh, working on the French Meadows project and then also beginning the process of introductions and uh, relationship building with, with other county departments and with our important external partners to sort of just bring all these ideas together. It's really only been in the past two months, I'd say, uh, December and January, where we've been able to really shift more into what I think was envisioned for this position at the beginning, which was more of an overarching coordination role. Um, and that's been super exciting, and I, I can really 
point to two specific things and people that made this, this uh, shift possible. Um, and that is just basically related to getting some more staffing support for the overall program work. So the first thing we did was um, applied for a Civic Spark fellow. So Civic Spark is a part of the AmeriCorps program. It's geared specifically to providing additional capacity to local governments to get work done that they otherwise wouldn't uh, related to community sustainability. And so we were um, luckily very successful in getting an awesome person, Phoebe Rogers, who I hope is joining us via Zoom today. And she'll be with us for a total of 11 months, um, working primarily on trying to identify the nexus areas between those different plans that you saw in the earlier slide to figure out where really the uh, Regional Forest Health Program can step in and help augment the activities that are already taking place. And then she's also doing some research on biomass regulations and technology with our partner, the Air Pollution Control District. So we're very excited to have Phoebe with us. And then secondly, um, Patty Armenteros, who's here in the room with us. Patty, if you could stand up and introduce yourself. Well, I'll introduce you, but this is Patty. She came to us after eight years with uh, Health and Human Services as a senior staff services analyst, and she has changed my life. So <laughs> we, um, thanks to Patty and Phoebe, we have truly been able to, to take on some of the bigger picture issues that I think were envisioned for this position at its beginning. We have a third major program area that we've been engaged with, um, particularly with other members of the county of county departments, um, but also some external groups as well that are looking at the potential for biomass utilization across the county and in various shapes and sizes, but all by means of disposing of this forest material that we're trying to remove, the fuel reduction activities, as well as the, unfortunately now, astronomical amount of residential green waste that we know is out there, which was there to begin with because we've done such a, the county previously has done such a great job of um, getting people to do their defensible space and to limit fuel around their own properties, but we just don't have the places to take this material. There are some uh, state, statewide regulations about trying to divert green waste from landfills that have affected what we can do with this, with this material. Uh, there's emission reductions kinds of regulations from the state that were, or, and goals that we're also trying to meet. So it's just critical that we, we solve this problem. And I, I'm here to tell you that there are many, many, many minds uh, that are working on this as we speak. Um, we also are working with some external partners, Plas Placer County Water Agency, the Air Pollution Control District. There's a Tahoe Basin Biomass Task Force, kind of a more informal group that's gathering. And then um, I also sit on a couple of statewide working groups and task forces that are looking into these issues. So there is a lot of work. I think Placer County is in a great position to be, again, a, a model, kind of out on the front edge of these discussions and activities. So I look forward to um, myself and, and probably many other of your departmental staff coming back with new ideas throughout the year about what we can do relative to biomass. Um, the fourth major area is community and agency fire mitigation. Uh, I'm still learning more about how kind of each department is conceptualizing these activities relative to, to each department's uh, goals and missions, but really the overall goal is to determine how our program can help uh, augment or otherwise support the great community-based work that's happening already. And you know that's largely through uh, departments like Office of Emergency Services, our Planning Services Department, our Public Works and Environmental Engineering, um, Parks and Open Space, the RCDs, our incredible partnership with CAL FIRE. I mean, there's just, again, no shortage of activity that, um, that needs to be learned about and hopefully uh, coordinated so that we can augment each other's uh, outcomes. And then the fifth and final area, really, that we've gotten into so far is advocacy. And that's helping to provide subject matter expertise, answer questions, review legislation or regulatory proposals uh, for whatever impacts they might have on forest health and wildfire risk reduction. So when it comes to what's next, it feels like there's an awful lot current <laughs> that just needs to be continued. Um, and, and dealt with in more, in more depth, I suppose. But I just wanted to share with you this graphic. Um, after holding about 30 introductory meetings with yourselves and with uh, departmental representatives and partners and putting all my notes together, uh, this word cloud 
is what came out, and I think it helps give a sense of what 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 your goals and expectations are, and and our partners and and other departments in the county um, goals and expectations might be for this regional forest health program. So you'll see an emphasis on obviously forests, funding, no surprise, projects, wildfire partners, opportunities, and the one that I loved the best was work. Uh, so along with the French Meadows project, again, the primary areas that we'll be continuing on in this coming year are, are the other four that we just outlined. But there are a couple of, um, a couple of key tasks that I, that I hope to launch pretty immediately as soon as we can. One is developing a countywide plan. So I want to add, I want to add a plan to that first slide um, that will help guide future landscape level work to complement the plans and the strategies that have already been developed for the neighborhood and community-based planning. And um, we envision this plan to really have two major components, and it's more of an interactive concept as opposed to necessarily a, a fully written plan. But the one tool that I'm super interested in is an interactive mapping tool that I have seen a couple of different uh, examples of where you can layer, inf date, um, layer information on different things such as projects that have already been accomplished in, in the county and where they sit on the map, um, e the infrastructure that we need to protect, where our residential areas are, our community resources, our transportation corridors, the kind of the things that we know we need to be protecting. And you layer that with data about conditions on the ground relative to fire risk and danger and hazard uh, and other types of conditions, fuel loading, things like that. And suddenly, you know, these, I don't want to use the word hotspots, that would be a terrible analogy, um, but these, these priority areas start to emerge and can help us um, prioritize where we want to seek investment and where we want to be working with our partners there might be gaps, even areas where it would be critically important to do work, but there isn't really an entity or an organization that is active in that area. So what does that mean for the county? How can we help support, you know, maybe even the creation of an organization that can start taking on some of these projects in those areas? And then related to that is a project pipeline, excuse me, which is kind of a best practice I think especially with the amount of money that we know is going to be coming from federal and state resources to have a list of projects that we know are either ready to go and just need funding or that we know our partners are really interested in, priority projects for our partners that we can then start matching those up with funding sources as we become aware of them. Uh, and it also really helps set the stage and provide um, context and justification for future funding requests. So if we, for example, the county is advocating for, you know, more funding to be put toward the Sierra Nevada Conservancy or CAL FIRE uh, for these kind of projects, we have a way that we can, you know, that we can show what the need is. Um, so that's, that's an important activity that I hope we can undertake. And we will also, of course, continue seeking funding. We've, um, uh, when I added this up, it was a bit surprising, but we've submitted nine funding requests uh, since May, and actually most of them since December. <laughs> so um, we will continue to do that and, and keep our fingers crossed that some of these will come through. Um, m many of them have been for French Meadows to complete that project so we can look at it in its entirety as a pilot. Um, but some of them, one of them at least, to the Sierra Nevada Conservancy has also been about this idea of a countywide plan and interactive map. So I just want to close with, um, with this thought, with my great thanks to our PIO office and to Document Services who somehow pulled this concept out of my brain. But if our water courses are the county's circulation system, then our forests are its DNA. That's how I'm thinking about it. It's our lifeline. They connect us as we travel from one part of the county to another. They provide many benefits and are used in many different ways, and ultimately, they define our way of life in Placer County. And that's why it's so important to protect them because protecting the forests from this large, damaging, crazy wildfires that we've been seeing is protecting our communities and neighborhoods and vice versa. So I hope this helps give you a sense of what's been going on for the past nine months and I look forward to any questions that you might have. Thank you. Thank you very much, Carrie. appreciate that. Any questions, board members? <coughs> Wrong button. <coughs> I do. Yes, super. Uh, great, great work, great presentation. Um, as you know from talking to me, my perspective is that 
uh, there needs to be a massive amount of resource applied to creating a circumstance where a forest can become healthy again after being neglected for 50, probably 100 years. So specifically to the, um, the project, uh, the uh, Kemp French Meadows project, uh, if we're about halfway through the treatment part of it, then we're going to transition into hopefully the maintenance part of it. So could you update me some on that? I mean, after once we make a forest the way it looked 100 years ago by thinning, et cetera, then we're going to have to maintain that. Otherwise, it's going to grow over again in 50 or 100 years, and we'll be right back where we started before. So where, where are we with the plans for the maintenance thereafter, and what does that look like? Most immediately, there's a plan for a great deal of prescribed burning that would come back and, and be applied in the same acres where the mechanical treatments have been occurring over the past three years so far. Uh, so that's, um, that's really the first step. And then after that, to be honest, it feels like it's a regulatory issue in a lot of ways because right now we can seek funding for a project, we can complete the project, we are expected to monitor the project, but there's no funding for typically little to no funding for ma ongoing maintenance because the folks who have the money want to go off and do the next project that makes the forest look like it did 100 years ago. So I think, um, you know, it'll be, a, it'll, it'll be partly continuing on the advocacy path and trying to identify ways where perhaps some maintenance money can be included in an initial grant, uh, maybe held like an escrow account, for example. I mean, this is just an idea. It's not been vetted anywhere except in my brain. <laughs> but I think there are potential tools that we could offer and talk about from a legislative and regulatory perspective with the funding agencies. Uh, and then in addition to that, I think it's creative thinking in terms of how we package the maintenance activities. I mean, they are projects in and of themselves, and, you know, if we can get the timing right, I think we can make the case for uh, these maintenance projects being a bigger bang for the buck even than the original projects because you, it's like insurance. You are, you are maintaining and supporting the work and the investment that you've already made. So it's not an easy question for sure and would always be no, so open to ideas. It kind of makes me think uh, what might be useful, you might have it already, but if we're going to take responsibility for our behavior, the largest property owner by far, I'm thinking of course, is the national forest, the federal government, therefore the funding in the long run should be targeted towards that. So maybe just running some numbers on those kinds of things as it relates to Placer County, if we are going to be this model uh, that, you know, like over a 50 year period, uh, there should be a federal obligation uh, for their uh, taking care of just like we take care of our homes um, and thereby the public policy that would follow from that benefit of avoiding catastrophic forest fires, the quality of the air that would be improved, the diminishing of greenhouse gas emissions as a result of catastrophic forest fires. That might be a great white paper to take back to, to Washington. Right. No, I appreciate that. And, and we are actually continuing to meet with our local and regional and national Forest Service leaders uh, to bring up ideas like this about just how do we move forward most effectively, uh, in part because of some of the challenges that we've been uh, experiencing. But this is certainly one of them, the fact that we do all this great work. You know, I'm not going to be around in 50 years. You might, but, um, <laughs> but you know, it's hard, to, it's hard now to kind of set up for that un unless we're thinking, thinking it through uh, in advance through, through advocacy and, and policy. So thank you for that. It's a great idea. Any other comments? Supervisor yeah, thank Holmes. You. Thank you, Chair. Uh, Gary, first of all, I'm uh, just pleased with the hard work you've done since you hit the ground running. Putting all the pieces together is really a, a tremendous challenge. Uh, and I, I appreciate that and um, look forward to you continuing uh, doing that. Uh, as far as, you know, one of the problems that uh, Supervisor Wygan brought forward about uh, what, how do we take, keep maintain this, and I think uh, you brought a prescribed burn, and now that the forest is clean and relatively healthy, I think prescribed burn would be a lot safer now that there's not all this forest waste on the ground. So that would be one option. And uh, certainly when we go back to, uh, and I've done this before, uh, when we go to DC or when I speak to RCRC, for example, I always bring up the French Meadows Project because it is a trendsetter. It is a, a very nice, uh, how collaborative 
everybody works together to reach a common goal. And so I continue to do that. Uh, and we, we need to just keep the pressure on and let everybody know what the good work we're doing here. So thank you very much. Well, thank you. I, I do want to just say that uh, the Nature Conservancy, who's one of the partners on the project, has its a separate agreement with the Forest Service to do, I want to say, roughly 7,000, 6 to 7,000 acres of prescribed burning that would come in after the mechanical treatment that's current, currently taking place. Because you're right, it's easier and far safer uh, to do a prescribed burn activity on ground that's already been somewhat cleared of, of ladder fuels. So that is a big part of this project's plan and hopefully will we'll, we'll be going forward as well. Thank you. Um, my only comment, I'm not seeing others. Um, I, kudos, thank you for coming here and kudos to our board for taking this huge step in, in making this a high priority focus for us. Um, I wanna make sure all of our county properties live up to the standards that, that our communities deserve. And I hear repeated comments from various uh, property owners that there's county property not maintained. So uh, I wanna make sure with your wisdom and leadership, you know, what those costs are and then make sure as we're looking at our budget for 22, 23, that's on Placer County to allocate those funds and make that a high priority for us to show examples of how we are walking the walk with our community members because we're asking a lot of them uh, and we need to set that example. So thank you. any insights on that and budget recommendations for each department, I would love to see so that our county properties, I know we've had to take action independent of a systematic approach. I'd like to see a systematic approach to all our county properties as well. Um, they're insignificant in the big picture of catastrophic wildfire, but um, they certainly set that example for all of us and for our um, residents to live by, so. Well, sure, and they're kind of the connective tissue as well. So we, um, uh, Josh Hunsinger mm -hmm. has already taken the first step of getting the database of all county properties, and that would be one of the first things that we'd load into this mm -hmm. interactive map tool if, we're, if we get that project funded and are able to go down that road in some way. So yes, I think clearly that's a, an important issue for many reasons, not least of which the one that you brought up. Thank you. Great, thank you. Thank you very much, Carrie. Um, and now I'll open it up for any public comment on this item, and I see some hands raised. Yes, sir. Good morning, Brennan Tuhi, Loomis, California. Uh, some five years ago or so, there was a program that was available in the county to do chipping on residential property. And I was under the impression that that chipping program was unfunded or something. And I'm wondering what the status is on that now. If you could address that, I'd certainly appreciate it. We'll take all the public comment and then we'll answer questions. Um, and good question. Yes. <clears throat> I'm going to read something here from the Board of Forestry. Call to action. Do you understand the Board of Forestry's proposed fire safe regulations under the new BOF regulations? You will not be able to pull building permits for your property if, one, your property is located on a dead end road with only one point of ingress, egress, including cul de sacs and looped roads. Two, any road leading to your property that has a tight curve with an inside radius of less than 50 feet is narrow or that is in poor condition and cannot support fire equipment that weighs less at least 75,000 pounds. Three, any shared driveway for two or more parcels will have to be upgraded to meet road standards. Four, any driveway exceeding 150 feet does not have a turnout near the midpoint of the driveway, if any driveway exceeds 800 feet, it must have two turnouts no more than 400 feet apart. Five, your parcel is one acre or larger, but does not have the minimum 30 feet setback for all buildings from all property lines and or the center of the road. If your property is underinsured and burns down with this passage, nobody will have the insurance coverage to rebuild the home. The new proposed regulations would potentially force you as the permit applicant to make all improvements to all roads from your lot parcel being developed to the nearest fully compliant roadway. Please send specific examples on how the proposed fire regulations would severely impact you and other property owners. 
We need concrete examples of real people who are either currently or in the near future going to have to meet the proposed requirements and will not be able to do so for whatever specific reason reasons. We are trying to create a narrative where we can point to the proposed language and explain how this could impact lives. Written comments shall be submitted to the following address, Board of Forestry, Fire Protection, Attention Edith Hennigan, Land Use Planning Program Manager, P.O. Box 944246, Sacramento. Uh, written comments can also be hand delivered to contact the person listed in this notice at the following address, Board of Forestry, Fire Protection, Room 1506-14, 1416 9th Street, Sacramento. And uh, we have a fax number of 916-653-0989. Uh, this is a fax number. Written comments can also be delivered via email at the following address, public comments at board of force or BOF dot Cal gov. Thank you for sharing that. You mentioned that earlier under public comment as well, and I was not familiar with that, so. And that was a 45 day notice. I got 30 days ago. Can, Thank can you. Ask yeah. a point of yes. yes. Do we know what bill number that is? Is it a bill before the legislature? I just want to make it's sure a, a we know. Board of Forestry uh, vote. And, uh, it's okay. I gave your yes. Sophie, uh, yes. The, we the we got a copy of this, board members, and we'll make sure the staff get it and we can board. look into uh, it. Yeah. Great. Thank you. Uh, any comments online on Zoom? Oh, yes, Mr. Nader. Good morning, Chairman Gustafson, uh, supervisors. Um, I hadn't intended on talking, but uh, I just wanted to check. Uh, we talked, uh, she talked about the tremendous amount of volume of waste that has to be somehow dealt with. And over the past number of years, we've talked about Cabin Creek, and I'm not sure if you brought it up when, in your discussion, um, that that biomass plant was obviously uh, being considered and processed and would really take care of a lot of the issues up in the, in the Tahoe Basin as far as the waste issue. The other is obviously Rio Bravo and Lincoln, and uh, they've been obviously taking some of that, but they're restricted to some degree by the state. And so I'm just wondering, is there any way to work with the state to get more latitude to get these kind of facilities going? Because this is really, uh, the, I think, the, the most productive way to get rid of a lot of this waste. So, Great. Thank you. thank you. Any online? Mm -hmm. Kim, go ahead and unmute your mic and give your comments. Kim, go ahead and try it now. Good morning. Um, thank you so much for, I just wanted to make a few comments. Um, thanking um, the Board of Supervisors and the county for the leadership that you're taking on the, the forest management policies in Placer County. Um, the French Meadows Project, uh, as stated earlier, is definitely a model program across the United States. And I just really wanted to acknowledge the work that's being done in Placer County. And I work with a lot of the, the rural communities um, that are in forested areas. And um, what you're doing in Placer County is definitely a model. So thank you for what you're doing. And I just wanted to recognize that. Thank you, Kim. And thanks for your support and Congressman McClintock's support. Anyone Hi. else on Zoom? OK, ma'am, I'm sorry to oh, have missed you. Problem. Good morning, thank you for your time. I actually wasn't planning on speaking a, about this either. Just curious though, in reference to the fire insurance aspect of this and the astronomical cost of that insurance and what people are paying out and how they're losing their homes and not even being able to make it because of the cost of the insurance. So I don't know if that's a part of this big picture, but I believe it would be so. I think that should be looked into also. And I'm sorry, we do need a name for the record. Thank you, Annette. <clears throat> Anyone else in the room that I may have inadvertently missed? Okay. Carrie, would you like to address a few of those questions? Yes. There we go. Okay, great. Thank you. So the residential chipping program uh, is actually operated in, a, in partnership, I believe, with the Office of Emergency Services and now also with our probation department to increase the number of crews that are available to be out uh, on the ground doing the work. 
So there has been a backlog. I think COVID had quite an impact, uh, particularly on our partner, the RCD, who is the Resource Conservation District, rather, uh, that has been working on this program as well. Uh, so I do know that it is a focus and that the county has really been working hard to try to find ways to get as many crews and equipment out on the ground as possible. And as more funding becomes available, that is certainly something that could be looked at in terms of additional equipment and additional partnerships. Carrie, thank you. In addition, I, the Board of Supervisors did approve an extra uh, supplemental funding for the chipping program this last year to try to expedite because of the backlog. So I know we approved, I want to say 150, around 150,000 more toward that program, but we can certainly consider that moving forward. Also had the question on biomass. Yes, so biomass also is, um, is a major effort with multiple departments. In terms of specific facilities, such as uh, the construction potentially of a Cabin Creek facility or working with Rio Bravo and others, that is happening primarily through the uh, environmental engineering uh, department with, the, or I'm sorry, not familiar with the nomenclature, but within Public Works, the environmental engineering team. And so, uh, you know, Cabin Creek is a, a facility that had been looked at previously. It didn't, uh, it didn't move forward for a variety of reasons, but I think um, everybody's in agreement that, con that conditions have changed to a degree that it's, it's worth looking at it again and perhaps updating some of the background information and feasibility studies and fuel source studies. Uh, I think fuel is probably the least of our worries, but we do need to know, and those who might be investing in the construction of such a facility, should it move forward, also need, need that kind of information. So I do believe that the county is um, looking at the possibility, again, in combination with other things, other technologies, other ways that we can deal with uh, this green waste. There's ideas such as uh, portable sawmills or, you know, or locating a sawmill at an existing industrial facility. So there are, there are a number of uh, opportunities that we are looking at and uh, will be continuing to review and evaluate and seek funding for or get the board's approval if we find one that makes sense. Supervisor Holmes, your light is on. Did you have a question? Yeah, I just have a comment. I know Pioneer Energy is working with the Western Placer Waste Management Authority uh, to perhaps have a biomass plant uh, at that site. City of Auburn is looking at, uh, just starting to look at the, uh, their wastewater treatment plant in Oprah for a biomass uh, uh, project. Uh, the rural county uh, representatives of California have formed the Golden State Natural Resources, and they're looking at uh, biomass plants in throughout Northern California. They have two sites, one, one in Lassen County, I believe, and one, I think, in Humboldt County. So anyhow, there's a lot of movement, finally, on biomass. Uh, as far as I'm concerned, I just want to get one of the damn things built so we can make sure that it works. <laughs> right, and, and I would add to that, um, the Truckee Tahoe Airport District is also looking at one in the Truckee area as well as uh, our staff are not just working with um, internal to the county, but they're working with the town of Truckee and all of the allied agencies in the Tahoe area for the Cabin Creek facility. So they're doing a pretty exhaustive look at, at um, that as well, and uh, North Star itself, North Star Community Services District is looking at a small one. I was really interested, I just heard a presentation on biochar and how that can be a benefit to our agricultural lands. And so that was a fascinating byproduct from biomass and potential for additional use. And, and so um, I think there's a lot of innovation happening and we wanna be at the lead of that in every way we can. Um, to move that forward. And then uh, I don't know if you can do anything. We'll look into the gentleman's uh, issues on that language and that warning and the comment on insurance. Uh, Carrie, this is um, I think more at our level on advocacy. I know um, I heard this morning at a meeting that uh, commercial buildings have a $3 million limit in uh, some of our right here on 49 uh, so uh, property that I was made aware of just rebuilt a $7 million building and can only get $3 million of coverage through the CalFair plan. And so they are at risk for $4 million out of their own pocket on fire insurance. So it is um, uh, more companies are leaving, I was told today, especially on the high-end properties. 
uh, by a broker here in the Auburn area. And so we need to, again, talk to our insurance commissioner. It's been a continued discussion of how we um, make changes at his level to ensure that people can have insurance on their properties, especially if they've taken the actions necessary to protect their properties and, and followed the recommendations. So, I think that's a critical piece. I mean, I'm a prime example. We got the letter after 40 some years mm -hmm. of being with the same insured, saying that they were no longer going to cover us for fire. And, you know, we called and said, well, gosh, we've put a lot of work into our property, as have our neighbors. Can you come out and take a look, you know, like you would if we had actually had a fire? No, 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 we can't do that, you know. And you get points in your favor if you're close to a fire hydrant, but you don't get points in your favor if you're downhill from an irrigation ditch, which we happen to be. So, you know, there's just these disconnects between how I think, how the insurance company looks at things from more perhaps of an urban type perspective than the rural perspective, which is where most of these at-risk properties are. So I think there's a lot of room for advocacy at all levels about all, like all levels of that, um, of those considerations that could potentially help the situation. Great, thank you. Well, great report. We're, oh yes. Just Supervisor a Gore. quick question about the CHIPPER program. Can people sign up and get on the waiting list? Right yes. now. I just yes. want to make sure that people are aware that uh, you can sign up. We do have a waiting list, but we've been making progress. So how do you get a hold of You know what? I think staff can let you know. Josh is sitting right across from you, so I'm sure he can give you an answer. Thank you, Carrie. Appreciate Thank you. it. Yeah, and one other comment is I know uh, a lot of people in the Weimar, Alta, Dutch Flat, Forest Hill areas, because of the winter storm damage, are very concerned with the amount of debris. We are continuing to work on and may consider augmenting chipping for those people that experience tremendous tree and shrub loss during the winter storms. So, thank you. Thanks, Carrie. Appreciate it. And great job. It's not even been a year. <laughs> moving us forward okay so with that we'll move to item four on our agenda our 1030 timed item which is community development resource agency uh, at large member zoning text amendment George Rizosco gonna need one <coughs> gonna need one second Yes, we're ready. Yes. 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 Thank you, uh, Chair Gustafson. It's very nice to be before the board this morning. Um, this morning before you is a proposed zoning text amendment to the at-large planning commissioner section of the Posh County Zoning Ordinance. Currently, two of the seven planning commissioners that are appointed by the Board of Supervisors to the Planning Commission are at large. The current the current uh, code says that one at large shall come east of the Sierra Crest, one at large should come west of the Sierra Crest. And it says those at large uh, commissioners shall reside either east of the crest or west of the crest, respectively. What we're proposing to do today is take out the term reside and say at least part time, reside at least part time east of the Sierra Crest or west of the Sierra Crest. The reason for this proposal is to widen the pool specifically in the eastern part of the county, east of the Sierra Crest. Currently, the county has a population of 405,306. Only 13,837 people live east of the Sierra Crest. Not a very... Say that number again. 13,000. 13,837. Almost 14. Not a wide pool to pick from when you're trying to look for planning commissioners. So, um, of note, we did go to the Granite Bay MAC. They're the only one that asked to hear this item. Um, they did make two recommendations. One was they were okay with the at-large east of the Sierra Crest, only residing there part-time, but they thought that they should reside full-time in District 5. And the other recommendation that they made was that 
the person who is the at-large for west of the Sierra Crest should reside full-time in the county. Um, when it went to the Planning Commission, there was not much debate. The only debate that really came up was what constitutes residency? Okay. This is a gray area, apparently. I did not know this until I undertook this zoning text amendment. Residency, according to um, our council, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, is the domicile to which you intend to return. Okay. That's pretty broad. I've also heard residency defined as where you registered to vote, live, you live in a certain area six months plus a day. I've heard all these definitions. So the Planning Commission kind of talked about this quite a bit about what constituted, do we need to look at that? And at the end of the day, what the decision was is that because every one of the Planning Commissioners, all seven, including that large, go through a vetting process with the board and are appointed by the board, that at the time of their appointment, the board could look at their residency and make a determination if it, if it met the definition at least part-time. So everyone seemed to be comfortable with that. So that's uh, where it was left. We are recommending that you um, approve the zoning text amendment. There's a resolution attached to your packet that has the changes. It's not very substantial. All it is is really the underlined and bold will be added and the strikeout part will be taken out. So I don't have anything else unless you have any questions for me. I apologize. It is an ordinance, not a resolution. I got confused for a second. Thank you. Okay. Great. Any comments or questions from the board members? Okay. Just yes. one. Yeah. Uh, thank you, George. Um, just one point which I thought was really good, which is we really should do more public outreach for these positions, right? Mm -hmm. Right. And so I think that um, I think this is important because um, one of the challenges, and I don't think folks realize, is that in order to really participate in a planning commission meeting, you got to drive an hour and a half to two hours to get to the location, and it often is a full day commitment, mm -hmm. um, and that's a couple of times a month. So we want to be able to have folks who have the ability to do that and have an interest to do that. So we're looking to expand the pool. Uh, but I do think that we have to do a better job of doing public outreach to let people know uh, not only this commission, but other commissions that we have. So yeah. I, I agree with that. 100%. And I think there was, there was a little bit of discussion. I, I don't think people really understood until some of the planning commissioners that are sitting right now started to talk about the vetting process that they went through. And when they started talking about you know, they made an application, they had interviews, they had all those sorts of things. People were like, oh, okay, so this just isn't something like, okay, you can become a planning commissioner. There really is a pretty thorough vetting. Great. Thanks, George. Yep. Okay. Public comment on this item. Is there anyone in the room who would like to speak to us on this item? Not seeing any. Any on Zoom? Okay. So we've closed the public hearing. We opened a public hearing. We closed it. And now? I will move, uh, I'll move approval of the item. Second. Okay. We have a motion by Supervisor Gore and a second by Wygant. All those in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Any abstentions? Great. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, we have uh, made it to 10.50 and a little past, so we're ready for our 10.50 timed item. This is a Chance and Dean rezone. Uh, and yes, Amy, thank you. Yes, go ahead. Okay. Okay. Good morning. My name is Amy Rossig with the Placer County Planning Services Division. The item that I have before you this morning is the Chance and Dean Rezone Project. This project is located in the unincorporated Colfax area. We're located just south of Rollins Lake and about 300 feet east of Nevada County. Um, access to the property is from Old Bridge Road, which connects to Highway 174, which continues on into Nevada County. 
and the project site's about 30 acres in size. The site's developed with a single family residence and a detached garage located in the northeastern corner of the property. This uh, residence was constructed in about 2005 and it was constructed with uh, permits and I can go into more detail about what permits were um, approved for that residence in a few more slides. Um, there's also a 1600 square foot agricultural building located more in the northeastern corner of the property and there is a 420 square foot that building that was intended to be built originally as a cabin. And the agricultural building and the cabin were both built by the current property owner. And these buildings were built without building permits because in the timber production zoning district, these buildings are only permitted if they support an ongoing agricultural timber operation. So the current zoning of the property is timber production zoning. The property is kind of surrounded by all other properties that are zoned with a base zoning district of farm. And the surrounding properties have a minimum parcel size ranging from 43,000 square feet to 100,000 square feet, which is equivalent to 2.3 acres. Um, so this, this picture is just kind of to show that this property is kind of its own island of timber production zoning district surrounded by farm zoning property. A little bit of background to this property. This property was zoned in 1977 to Timber Production Zoning District along with 450 other parcels in Placer County. And why that happened, I'll kind of go over in another slide. We know that the site was harvested for timber in the early 90s by the property owner that owned the property at that time. We know that that occurred because there is an improved timber harvest plan that was approved by the State Department Board of Forestry. In December of 1999, the property owner at that time requested approval of a minor use permit for a caretaker's residence to um, harvest the site and use the property as a timber operation. And then the property ended up changing hands and a new owner ended up taking over in August of 2004. And they started construction of the caretaker's unit. And during that time, they ended up requesting a variance for the caretaker's unit. And during that time when the variance was considered, the eligibility of the caretaker's unit was considered because staff felt that there was no ongoing timber operation and that maybe the caretaker's unit was not necessary. Um, but ultimately staff um, approved the, well, allowed the caretaker's unit to remain on site. So it was ultimately finalized in about 2005. And then the applicants, Aaron Dean and Derek Chance purchased the property in September of 2012, and they have been living on the property ever since. They do not have any ongoing timber operation, and they do not plan to in the future. So they have requested to rezone their property to farm with a um, combining zoning of 100,000 square feet or 2.3 acre minimum parcel size. Um, since the this is the larger of the two minimum parcel sizes in their area because they are one of the larger properties in this area. The 100,000 square feet was uh, proposed. So kind of go over how this property ever became into the timber production zoning district. We're going to go back to the 70s. The state of California um, birthed the timber production zoning district out of the Williamson Act. And the Williamson Act's purpose is to um, preserve agricultural um, supplies. And so the timber production zoning district was birthed out of, out of that. And the state of California uh, tasks all the county assessors to determine properties in California that had the highest and best use as timber production. And those properties were rezoned to the timber production zoning district. Um, but today, as that ordinance has changed and evolved, um, a, for a property to go into a timber production zoning district, there are requirements. Um, the, for instance, the parcel size must be at a minimum of 160 acres. Um, you have to demonstrate the timber site quality classification. You have to have a forest management plan prepared and demonstrate that the parcel meets current timber stocking standards. So the primary purpose of the timber production zoning district is for the growing and harvesting of timber. Residential um, uses are typically not allowed unless a minor use permit is approved. Um, in return, a property owner receives a reduction on their taxes, and the taxation would be based on the value of the timber at the time that the property is harvested for timber. And properties are locked into this 
um, restriction for a period of 10 years, which automatically renews annually. Should a property owner seek a new zoning district, they have several options. Um, first is that they could submit a notice of non-renewal and request a new zoning district. Uh, once that new zoning is approved, and within 10 years, the new zoning um, would go into effect. During that 10-year period, their taxes would incrementally increase during that time. And ultimately, at the end of the 10 years, it would be the uh, value of the property at a residential more than likely, uh, or whatever their new zoning and use is. Or they can request an immediate rezone, and the Board of, for or the board of Supervisors would submit um, a recommendation to the State Board of Forestry with the following findings made. And the first is that the conversion was in the public interest, that changing the zoning would not have a substantial and unmitigated adverse effect on other properties, also zoned timber production within one mile, that the soil slope and watershed conditions are suitable for the proposed uses. That the existence of an alternative use cannot be considered. There has to be no nearby suitable land located in proximity that this alternative use could be located on. And that the uneconomic character of the existing use cannot be a reason for an immediate reason. The uneconomic character is only considered if there is no reasonable or comparable timber growing use to which the land may be put. So the property owners have requested an immediate rezone as part of this application process instead of a 10-year rollout. So as staff, we, for, we analyzed that request further. First, we looked at the community plan consistency. The site is designated a special study corridor in the Colfax community plan. And the purpose of this is to allow careful attention to protect natural scenic and recreational resources and to encourage limited development. While the project would change the zoning and allowable uses, the project does not include land development activities such as a minor land division or additional construction beyond permitting what's existing there. Further, the land development project was proposed, it would be analyzed on its own merit for consistency with the community plan and as staff the rezoning request would be consistent with the community plan. Next is consistency with the surrounding districts, zoning districts and land uses. The 30 acre site is surrounded by parcels that range in size from one acre to 10 acres in size, and all surrounding parcels have a base zoning district of farm. Surrounding parcels to the south and the east have a minimum parcel size of 43,000 square feet, and surrounding parcels to the north and west have a minimum parcel size of 100,000 square feet, or 2.3 acres. Surrounding parcels are developed with single family residences and do not include timber harvest uses. So the farm with the 2.3 acre minimum proposal is consistent with surrounding uses and zoning. Next is the timber harvest feasibility. We know that the site was harvested in 1994 and 1995 for timber production. The applicants hired a registered forester named Terry Rogers, who has been a forester since 1983. He visited the site in July of last year and provided details regarding the current conditions of the site and its harvesting feasibility. He said that a great number of Canyon Live Oak, California Black Oak, and majority brush species have taken over the site. And there is now more oak and brush species prior to the harvest in the 1990s. He concluded that while timber could grow, it is practically impossible to harvest the timber for several reasons. First is that the site has a water, water course that is steep and does not flatten until you reach the stream. Second is that the site class and parcel size. The site was, is graded on a scale of one to five for timber production purposes, with one being the best and best kind of quality of timber. Um, the project site is dominated by a class three, which is kind of middle of the range. And the California Department of Forestry and Fire Product Fire's position is that as a parcel size gets smaller, timber harvest becomes less viable. And that the smaller the parcel is, the more appropriate it is to have the more productive timber growing on the property. And lastly is the immediate rezone. As part of the application process, the applicants requested an immediate reason. We've analyzed the documentation provided by the applicants and determined that there is not sufficient evidence to request the immediate reason request, as the request would not be within the public interest. Further, there is nearby land, which is already zoned farm, which would allow for residential uses, though these parcels are smaller in size compared to the project site. So we were unable to make the required findings for the immediate reason and we're supporting a 10-year rollout. 
However, during that time, should the property owners consider an immediate rezone and have new information to provide that could be considered during that time. We have had three public meetings uh, regarding this project. The first one was before the Agricultural Commission in April of 2021. The Agricultural Commission had a very lively discussion and the Ag Commission expressed their support for the rezone out of the timber production zoning district because the property is not currently used for timber production and it is used as a residence. It has been for some time and the property owners continue to use it as a residence. However, they did not believe that there were sufficient grounds to support an immediate rezone. We have also gone before the Weimar Applegate Colfax Mac in June of last year. And the MAC felt that the property is currently being used as a residence and any future development would require discretionary approval. So they were in support of an immediate rezone so that way the property owners could utilize the property as a residence. And then in December of last year, we went before the planning commissioner. Uh, commissioner Johnson is a, is a registered forester. So he provided a lot of insight and stated that from his experience, immediate rollouts are very rare and the findings are difficult to make. He applauded the applicant's forester for attempting to make the findings, but felt that there was not enough evidence to support an immediate rollout. And Commissioner DiMatelli uh, asked the applicants about their future plans for the property. They stated that they have an adult children and they would like to subdivide the property to give to their children. Uh, but with the 10 year restriction, they wouldn't be able to do the subdivision until further, until that 10 year period has ceased. So in a six to one vote, um, the planning commission recommended the rezone with a 10 year rollout. So I'm carrying forward the Planning Commission's recommendation to rezone the property with a 10 year, uh, effective 10 years from date of approval based on the findings, conditions, and the staff report, and to adopt the negative declaration, which was prepared pursuant to CEQA. Thank you, Amy. Thanks. Thorough presentation. Board members, do you have any questions? Supervisor Holmes? Yes, thank you, Chair. Um, in the staff report on page 19, it says, um, the agricultural building and guest house were constructed without building permits and are subject to ongoing code enforcement action. What is the status of the code enforcement action? Currently, we're waiting for a determination on the rezone. Um, but if the rezone is approved, then they could, the property owners have demonstrated that they could pull building permits. So we would like them to uh, permit those buildings. So one was built as an agricultural building? Yes. Is there any agricultural use on that property now? Uh, it's my understanding that the property owners have chickens in that building. But they could probably specify more. Okay, thank you. Any other questions, board members? Amy, I had a question yes. on, uh, and this might uh, be more for county council's office. Um, because the owners received a tax benefit for a number of years and they've had these buildings built and have had the benefit of using these buildings during that time, if we were to um, consider an immediate rezone, are there penalties or back assessments that they can be levied? No. I don't have a great answer to that one. I, uh, it's something we'd need to look into in terms of being able to recoup some of the tax payments. Um, but uh, yeah, that's something I'd be looking for. I could um, provide it more sounds like I, It sounds like county council would like to address this. <laughs> uh, just to give some more clarification to, to this, if you're talking about the immediate rezone, mm -hmm. um, basically the assessor would assess the property based on what's on the rolls. And these buildings uh, were built without building permits, so would not be included in that assessment, which um, with the immediate rezone is basically recouping all the past taxes at one time. Uh, once those, if and when those, pro those buildings are legalized, um, the assessor would then assess those based on an additional improvement of the project. Uh, with the 10-year rollout, uh, it's, it's a graduated um, step up in terms of increasing the, the taxes every year. I don't know and would have to check with the assessor um, based on the fact that I don't see that there's anything that would preclude um, planning even on a 10-year rollout from enforcing the fact that we have buildings that were built without building permits. 
and that those need to be brought up to code or otherwise resolved based on a 10-year rollout with the current zoning. Um, and I think it would be a conversation with the assessor at that point as to if and when those buildings are, are legalized, what the new assessment would be. Yeah, I, I'm just, again, looking at equity between property owners uh, in the vicinity that are paying much higher property taxes and have been on their improvements, and this one hasn't because of this zoning. Um, I don't have any issue with the change in zoning, I don't think, on the, the timber harvest. It seems like we have good agreements there, but I am concerned about that equity between taxpayers for uh, services that we render as, as a county in general. We need everyone paying their fair share, and the best way we do that is through assessed values. And so... If, if I could, yes. Chair, just mm -hmm. mention one more thing, too. The code enforcement action that's pending, those uses aren't allowed on the current zoning of TPZ, mm -hmm. so it would be 10 years until those, per, those uses are allowed. So the, the code enforcement action uh, that's pending right now would um, be solved within 10 years if it did do the 10-year rollout. You know, so often when you bring us items, they're not the easy button <laughs> items, right? We, it, because I think, you know, from our perspective, I don't want to disallow what they're doing. I just want them to have to pay, you know, in my mind, what is equity uh, to the county tax roll. So yeah. that's right. just a, a perspective. I don't know that we have the authority to do that, but it just seems what would be fair. The only thing I would add here is that, um, as staff just discussed, there are some very express findings for an immediate rezone. Mm -hmm. uh, you have to be able to make those findings. And one of them, it is not legalizing buildings or uses that were not permitted to begin with. That's not part of the findings. Yeah. And, and I read these, and it, I, I, I realized that we have to make certain findings for that immediate rezone. And it's a little confusing. but. Great. Yes, we're going to get to you in just a minute. So any other questions? And then we'll ask you to come up as the applicant. Can I provide a little bit more detail? Yeah, yes. So there is a tax recruitment fee that's embedded into the timber production zoning district by the state. The state has this very convoluted formula, but I have worked oh, with the county. Oh, I'm not surprised. <laughs> I have worked with the county assessor's office to figure out mm -hmm. a ballpark of what that recruitment fee would be because they would, if they do an immediate rezone, there is, the county would kind of get some of that money back some, in some ways. From the timber, the, the value difference. of the timber to the property value as improved today, right. except for the new buildings that they've been using since 20, at least 2018. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you, Amy, for that background. Okay. Yes. Uh, Unless there's other questions by, oh yes, Supervisor Holmes. Yeah. Um, what, how, do you, how do they access that property? Oh, from Old Bridge Road, which connects to Highway 174. And Old Bridge Road is a private road. There's a gate at the beginning of the property. There's a couple other parcels that go back there. And NID also owns some land. So is that a paved road? Is it, you know, or just a private road that's... I, I think it's part of it's, yeah. 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 I, I can let the applicant state to that. It's been a while since I've been okay. out there. And then... Um, wasn't there a fire in that area mm -hmm. recently? Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, yeah, there was a fire that kind of went up right up to their property line from the, the maps property. that I've yep. seen. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thanks, Supervisor Helm. Okay, we'd like to invite the applicants up but before we go to the public on this item. Hello. Hello. Thank you for having us. Um, <clears throat> real quick on the agricultural building. Take this off. Um, there was a previously permitted agricultural building. Sustained damage due to a fire, we rebuilt it without the current permit. Okay. So it wasn't just completely brand new. And that had been built by the previous owner? Correct. Okay. Permitted through the county as an agricultural. Yes. Okay. That was allowed in Placer County. Great. Would you like to say more about the project and your... Uh, and also, yeah. they are all paved roads. Okay. I think that's what you were asking. Old Bridge Road and then our drive. Okay. Yeah, you know, the bottom line is why we're here is, um, you know, we live in a state with a housing crisis. And I'm sure everyone's well aware of the prices shooting through the roof currently. Um, <clears throat> in a 10-year rollout, my kids who are in their late 20s or wrapping up college, Early 30s. they're going to be priced out of the housing market completely. They're going to have to leave the state. That's just what it seems like it's going to is um, 
and the way we want to provide some housing to them is, is by cutting out some of our property and letting them build a house on it and that kind of thing. Um, I have two children, she has one, so we're talking about three lots that we really want to uh, give to our kids and let them afford their housing. And that's really the bottom line of the, of the entire project is, is getting them a slice of the pie, so right. to speak. Sooner than later, they're ready to get married and start their families and their college graduates even, they can't afford anything. Also to let you know, the cabin that was built on the property, it was not done behind anyone's back. We were given the impression by the building department that it was okay. After we began building it, we came back and talked to someone else at the building department, and he read a little bit further into the TPZ zone, and where the parts that says you can, you can build employee housing, you can build agricultural buildings, you can build this and that. Well, you turn the page and it says, out of all these things, you can only choose one. And so, and we were literally halfway through the building of this cabin, <clears throat> which was gonna be some employee housing to do fire clearing. Um, we have 30 acres, it's completely overgrown. We've spent an entire summer, two of us, clearing as much as we could, and we cleared a little bit less than an acre. Mm -hmm. So we had this grand idea of <clears throat> building some employee housing, putting a couple in there that could literally work around the clock and do literally clearing and, and fire prevention. Uh, that was the original plan for the cabin. Great. Anything else you'd like to share? You know, when it comes to the difference between the, the immediate rezone and the 10-year rezone, um, you know, we're not in our 20s anymore. Um, I want to get onto this project before I'm in my mid-60s. <clears throat> And also my kids, you know, they're at the age where they're gonna start looking for housing and that kind of thing. They're starting to, to um, have families and things like that. So we just really wanna carve out a piece for them. And it's, uh, it's and really I, important to I us. I feel like we've definitely met and exceeded the criteria, like proving that, you know, we are just mis-zoned at this point. Um, it should have never even been zoned TPC in the first place. It, it didn't even meet cr the criteria then, it was just, it happened to be a lot of properties owned by PG&E and they just forced it in. Mm -hmm. So, and as you can see, we are surrounded by, you know, residential and we have gotten that negative declaration so that this would not be an impact to anyone. The roads, our surrounding neighbors, I mean, we're just trying to enjoy the property that we own, you know. Mm -hmm. It's certainly not in the public interest to be located in the middle of a neighborhood and to expect to have some type of logging operation. There's no access to that property except for our driveway. So you're talking about literally building roads that will support logging trucks and heavy equipment. None of that stuff can get in there currently. And there's a reason why you guys have set forth the criteria of 160 acres of TPZ. It's because of that. You're not, you're not gonna spend $100,000 building infrastructure to harvest $20,000 worth of wood. It's a simple supply and demand. It's just not gonna work. I think everyone here is in agreement that that this property does not produce timber in, in the future, will not produce timber. Um, that's the bottom line too. Um, also, just to give you a brief I idea of how much taxes we've been saving, it's about $350 a year that we save having this zone TPZ. Yes, so we're not talking about a great deal of money. Um, and so. And from what I understand, the tax recoupment fee goes back to the date from when it was first um, put into TPC, so back into the 70s. So we would be paying that amount for every single year, which so we have no problem with. We're gonna okay. be paying taxes that other people didn't pay. Okay. And also one other thing is there's lots of small properties in this community um, that are zoned TPC, that the county is not taxing at the current rate and they're losing lots of revenue by not seeking those out and weeding them out of the TPC program. And um, our forester went into more detail with that as well, how these are just a hindrance to the program. Great. Well, thank you for those clarifications. Board members, any other questions for the applicant? Okay, thank you very much for being here. We now need to conduct a public hearing on this item. So I'll open the public hearing. Do we have any public comments on this item? I'm not seeing any on Zoom either, right, Megan? Okay, so with that board, um,
I'll bring it back to you. I will start off by saying uh, the Weimar Mac, the WAC Mac, <laughs> one of my many Macs, um, did vote to move this forward more quickly um, in regard to assisting in this situation. It certainly seems to me at least that these people fell into a situation we have all the time where zoning changes um, over time. We know a lot more now than we did in the 1970s when we uh, went this route. So uh, trying to make sure that uh, we do um, what, is, what is right today, but I am sensitive to the buildings without a permit. It sounds like there was a pre-existing building in the one situation. So anyway, just kind of my thinking around this is about uh, moving forward and uh, it sounds like there is a plan going back on paying that, but. So, um, if I may, mm -hmm. um, a couple of questions. I, I'd really like to understand the reasoning the state has with the 10-year timeline. Um, and then if you could also just re-explain um, the findings as to why not immediate, right? Like, the property has not been utilized for timber since the 90s. Um, so it's been more than 10 years where it's not been utilized for the purpose that it was zoned for. Um, so if you could um, explain the 10-year timeline um, and then the reasons why staff dif disagrees with the forest, their forester about uh, why it's not in the public interest. Sure. Uh, the, the first one, the 10-year rollout, it's set by statute. Um, and the reasoning, I believe, for that was to gradually um, bring the property back in and, re and uh, elevate the tax amounts owed. It, it may be very little for this property, but if there is a bigger property, those tax amounts would be higher. So the 10-year rollout was to uh, bring them back into the fold of the tax recoupment um, prior to bringing them back in. The reasons uh, for the immediate rezone that, um, that the staff has indicated that there's trouble making findings for, um, there's two of them. One, uh, they must uh, show that there is no land in the proximate area that would be suitable for the applicant's uses, which is not already properly zoned. Basically, a showing that there's no parcels in the neighboring area that would be adequate for what the applicant is intending to do with the property. Meaning that, I'll clarify, there are other properties nearby that are zoned two and a half acres five acres, et cetera. So because there are other properties that are zoned, what they want to zone it to, that doesn't meet the criterion. Right. Okay. Um, and the other one is, if, if the claim is that there is an uneconomic un character of the use, that the basically the harvesting doesn't create an economic benefit, um, the, the statute says that that shall not be sufficient reason for the conversion the uneconomic un character of the existing use may be considered only if there is no other reasonable or comparable timber growing use to which the land may be put. So you have to show that there's no viable timber growing uh, use at all. Um, right. Okay, so even though there is a small viable use, right, like it's uh, level three, um, but it would cost a whole lot of money to do that, and there is not a whole lot. And it, it still wouldn't right, meet. and it still wouldn't meet our current criteria of 160 acres needed to be viable. Correct. Right. 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 So there is some timber on there. I think it's intermediate uh, level, so somewhat okay. I think the problem with this property is in part the topography it makes it difficult, as well as the access roads it makes it difficult yeah. to actually harvest it. But um, and and thank you. And then. Um, but if we went to the immediate rezone, a couple things. Those taxes could get recouped earlier. That would be my understanding. And then the other thing that I noted, which I think is interesting, is that the final approval of an immediate rezone um, is granted only if the State Board of Forestry and Fire Protection approves the conversion. So ultimately, the state, if we were to move for a, an immediate, the, the state ultimately has to um, agree and approve it as well um, and you know my frustration with this is you know, they heard these strict criterion but it logically it doesn't make sense I understand what the state is saying but logically like that property isn't great for timber use it was it, it's no longer the same type of wood it's now scrub oak for the most part um, and 
there are some benefits of allowing a property owner to rezone, especially if it hasn't been used like that for 10 years. So I, I really struggle with this because it's a, a state law that was done a long time ago and no update to it. So I'd like us to allow them to do it immediately. And I think that we could find some findings and then at the end of the day, the state has to finalize it. But that's Thank you, Supervisor cents. Gore. Supervisor Jones? Yes, um, can you guys tell us a little bit about <clears throat> the historical process? You've got the one parcel that's 30 acres. <clears throat> when it says the requirement is a minimum of 160 acres, so it doesn't fit that bill, but how is it, how were the other properties around it um, historically? Have they always been farm or were they ever timber? <clears throat> So it's my understanding that the surrounding properties have always been some sort of farm residential zoning district. Um, when this property was zoned to timber production zoning, the only requirement was that the highest and best use was for timber production. So this property at one time was not zoned timber? Correct, yeah. Prior to 1977, 1977. it was not. <clears throat> it was probably zoned farm or residential. So, and it's our understanding that there's not really any access ingress egress uh, that would be suitable to timber production is that correct yes yeah getting the logging equipment in that area right. with those roads the roads would have to be reconstructed and improved so yes. that's what the foresters indicated in their report that the access and topography are problematic for for harvesting timber right so that seems to sort of discount the idea that it's should be maintained as timber production property when somebody's going to have to do some major road construction in order to even allow that kind of equipment in right i think that was one of the points that the forester was trying to make is that it would be really expensive to harvest the site for timber production mm -hmm. and it wouldn't be feasible it, the, it doesn't pencil out so it's a bit of a contradiction to say we should keep it as timber production but yet it's not feasible not rational to do so okay right and i think our decision today is more about if is it an immediate or is it uh the 10-year rollout and that's what's being decided today so and supervisor holmes yes thank you um uh the item that we had before us was about regional forest health mm -hmm. and what we're doing to try to lessen the threat of wildfire and then the item that we're going to be hearing a little later on about the housing related code amendments is an example of further state legislature res restricting our land use authority. And I'm not opposed to do the 10 year rollout. What I am uh, fearful of is that, that this parcel is in a fire zone and we just had a fire there. And why, why would it be in the public interest to allow more development in a fire zone? And so I'm not going to be able to support the immediate rollout. I, I, I recommend that we uh, allow the 10-year rollout, which they have the right to do that, but I can't support any more development in a fire zone because the state legislature is going to use this as an example to restrict more of our land use authority. So. And Supervisor Gore? So that's an interesting point, Supervisor. Um, but if we, if somebody were to subdivide, then you actually have more property owners taking care of that property um, and actually having to do defensible space and trying to uh, make that property um, livable. So, I mean, I think it could go either way. Um, and, and I do look at private property rights, and I think we could find some findings in this case where, you know, do you wait 10 years when it hasn't been utilized? It's not viable for um, timber usage. Um, so hear your point, but at the same time, I think um, that the rezone, whether it's now or in 10 years, I think is worthwhile. I'd, I'd prefer it to be immediate and, and change some of the findings, which I think we could make. I, I uh, will weigh in briefly that um, I think it's ironic 
that at a time we can't get rid of the fuels in our forest, we have any thought that we did in 1977 that we have to create more land for timber harvest. I mean, we just hear throughout our communities, throughout my area of representation, everybody wants more help getting fuel out of their, their properties, and the winter storm helped, but <laughs> unfortunately in a horrible way, but it, um, we have so much more to do. So the emphasis the state has had on timber harvest zones doesn't make any sense to me when we, you know, in areas that are within subdivisions versus, you know, really getting people on the ground and having a, a reason to move forward. How long has it been, Clayton, since this code of the Board of Forestry was changed on this rollout? Uh, 4621.2? I know it was amended in 1990. I believe this was all part of the Timberland Productivity Act, though, which was in the late 1970s. So, so the state's own code hasn't been updated to consider these, these properties that don't make sense anymore for timber harvest production. Uh, there aren't mills to take the lumber. There's no biomass to take, you know, we don't have places to take this even if it were heavily timbered and we're hearing it isn't. So those are all my factors, Jim, and I understand. I, I think people taking care of their own properties is, is critical and we don't have the mechanism to take care of it. So, but yeah. Uh, I'm, I'm sure that whoever owned the property and developed it would take care of their property. The fire's gonna come from outside the property, like with the one that just came, came up the hill. Yep. And so again, uh, I'm fearful that the state of California the legislature is gonna restrict us more on our, and this will be an example. And when was the last time a, there was immediate rollout of a timber production zone? Yeah, my, my recollection is up in the Tahoe area. There's one years ago, if, uh, but that's the only one that I'm aware of. Bunch Creek, that, that came to your board several years ago. That was not approved. That was not approved. Yeah. For the same reason. And similar to Williamson Act contracts. You know, I've, I think we've only had one, uh, you know, immediate cancellation, you know, in the last, what, 20 years? Yeah. So, yeah. Again, it's, it's, it's a problem of... Uh, public safety and it's not in the public interest. Uh, there may be people taking care of their property, but if there's a fire that comes into that area, uh, you know how those house can burn because of timber or embers and everything. So I can't support uh, more development uh, in a fire zone area. It's just not practical and it's not in the public interest. Thank you. Supervisor Jones, your light is on. Yes. Um, Clayton, what's the purpose in having a 10-year rollout? So it was created by state statute, and my understanding is that it was to recoup the tax benefits to make sure uh, people didn't switch in and out of a timberland productivity uh, zone land just for the tax benefits. That it, In order to get out of it once you were in it, you had to go through a 10-year process, and part of that was moving back up to the taxing amounts that would be if it was not Timberland Productivity Zone. So once you started into that process of the 10-year rollout, you can't go back, for like you said, for the tax benefits. You can't go back and forth, right? Once you're in it, the rollout, you're in it. Right. You can remove yourself and remain TPZ zoned, but yes, you have to go through the whole 10-year plan to get out of it. Okay. So my question is, if we do the 10-year rollout, all we do is postpone build out for 10 years. I, I don't see any difference in a build out now or a build out in 10 years. Do we have it within our purview to shorten that time, the 10 years, or is it all or none? The, the 10 years is set, and the difference between the 10-year rollout and the immediate uh, rezone is the, the findings. This, the, the legislature has included additional findings for an immediate rezone that okay. you don't need to make if you're doing a 10-year rollout. Okay, so for an immediate, you have to make findings, though. Have you looked into findings for an immediate? Yes, and I, I think that's uh, where staff is, is um, kind of troubled on this one, is that it, um, it is very difficult to make those findings. Um, and, but we can certainly, if the board is interested, take a shot at it and bring this item back, and then you can evaluate it. 
in, if I could add, in this instance, if the board wants to move forward uh, with, with uh, the immediate rezone, first of all, it would have to be a tentative action because the findings need to be conformed. And it would be the board that would articulate the findings to staff so that we could prepare those properly. Okay, so then my last question is, of the surrounding properties around this, um, are any of those developed? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All, all of them? Mm -hmm. Most of them are, yes, oh, okay. with residences. Mm -hmm. How's their, how are their fire breaks and everything? Do you have any idea whether? Okay. All right. Well, thank you. Supervisor Wygant. Well, so for me, the question as to whether or not the property is properly zoned or not is pretty simple. To, today, it wouldn't even meet the standards of going into uh, timber production uh, because it's not of the adequate size by a long distance 30 compared to 160 acres <clears throat> further uh, all the properties around it are uh, incompatible with timber production they're small acreage lots that would be um, in tremendous conflict if there was active uh, timber harvesting on this property the roads are not adequate so then the only question comes down to whether or not it should uh, roll out over a 10 year period or immediately. Um, and one way I think to think of that is to consider this being very much parallel to the Williamson Act whereby um, my family's property is in Williamson Act contract so it would take 10 years for it to uh, roll out uh, and have the property taxes uh, increase. But if you see large holdings, for example, out on the valley floor that oftentimes get acquired by uh, speculator developers, they would want an immediate rollout essentially for almost immediate development. So, so that 10 year time frame slows down its brakes on that process so that there isn't that kind of wholesale unplanned or planning done without long term perspective. So that's a big part of what's going on here. In this case, um, I know that the two findings are more challenging, but in that you have inconsistent state law in the first place, one saying you have to have 160 acres for a minimum zoning for timber production and a 30 acre parcel that is more challenged to make findings. I, I just see no public policy benefit by having it be a rollout of a 10 year period. I think it's um, well suited for an immediate rollout. And I would only add that um, if there's a fire risk because of small acreage lot development that's going to stay the same 10 years from now as compared to what it is now. It's a function of the property owners who buy and build there, managing their properties well. And I'm guessing that somebody buys a two and a third acre lot there and builds a house that they're going to be more concerned about managing the property uh, for fire risk as compared to a 30 acre parcel in the midst of all of that uh, that can't be harvested. Those are my thoughts. Okay. Uh, we've taken public comment and we're closing that part of the public hearing and then I'd look for guidance from the board. So I would like to um, actually move forward with, with an immediate rezone and that would be my motion and with the findings of looking at, I mean we can take some of the findings that the forester uh, from the property owners um, looked at um, and and maybe a tentative action and then staff can come back to us with those findings that we can then take action. So that'll be my motion. Yes, so your, your motion would be a tentative action uh, to approve immediate rezone. And then we need to continue this to a date and time certain to have uh, and direct staff to prepare the findings to conform to your motion. Yes. Second. Okay, we have a motion a second. Do we need to announce that date now, Karen? So I'll look to Megan to give us a date for that item. If this motion uh, Would Cedar be able to, I mean, I would look to them for the date to okay. come back. My thought is March 8th. Yeah, about 30 days out. That would is that plenty yep. of time for you? Okay. Okay. So then I would recommend to the board that we bring this item back on Tuesday, March 8th at 9.50 a.m. Okay, so do you accept that motion amendment with that time and yes. date and time? And you, the second of, of, okay. 
Then all those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? No. Okay. Any abstentions? Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, I know all of you are here for an item that we're late on. I'm wondering if we could just take a, a three-minute break and come right back. Um, and thank you for your patience. I'm sorry. I just take a really quick break here. There we go. We're going to reconvene the board meeting now. I wanted to make a quick announcement um, that item number seven uh, on our agenda today, uh, which is housing-related code amendments, we will be meeting until 1.30, but I want to let anybody know who is listening in to the meeting or here in person on that item, we are going to continue that item. Uh, to a future date. So we, um, I wanted to make sure that anybody in the public that was here for that item, that item will be continued. And so with that, I know most of you are here for a different item, and that is our camping ordinance. That is our uh, item number six on our agenda. It can be found on page 77 of our board packet. And Becky Regan is here. Good morning, Chair Augustus and members of the board. Becky Riggin from the County Executive Office. Um, I'll start by setting a little bit of context around this item for folks in the audience or listening in who may be somewhat um, newer to uh, these conversations. Um, staff initially presented an updated draft camping ordinance for your consideration at, its, um, at your January 11th meeting. This was in response to a number of concerns raised by constituents and staff as to the eroding state of the Placer County Government Center, along with the increasing health and safety concerns for staff and residents who use those county government buildings and, and for those who are camping on the Government Center. At that meeting, your board directed modifications to the draft ordinance to include adjusting the timing for allowable camping from 7 p.m. to 7 a.m an exemption for inclement weather, and allowing Sheriff's Office discretion to determine other exemptions as they felt appropriate. Your board further directed staff to develop a plan for a service center located at the Placer County Government Center along the lines of the previous wellness center that would provide outreach and drop-in services for this population. Staff returned to your board with those modifications at its next meeting on January 25th in Lake Tahoe. With the proposed, while the proposed ordinance is a countywide ordinance, um, it is being proposed uh, primarily in response to the large tent encampment occurring at the Placer County Government Center in an area adjacent to the new Health and Human Services building, which is currently under construction on the campus. Thus, at the request of constituents, your board deferred hearing the item until today's meeting in Auburn. However, over the past week, staff have received a number of emails and phone calls from residents with questions and concerns related to the proposed camping ordinance. Calls have come from a number of private individuals and from the Placer People of Faith Together and the Sierra Foothills, Foothills Unitarian Universalist, which are two community-based groups that work on social issues here in Placer County. In light of these discussions with these community groups and individuals, your board may wish to consider deferring introduction of the ordinance until your March 8th meeting. This will not impact the implementation timeline of the ordinance and will allow the opportunity for staff from the Sheriff's Office, Probation, County Executive Office, and Health and Human Services to meet with these folks, to hear their perspectives, and to incorporate those discussions into our next presentation. Staff's efforts on developing the operational plans for the service center will continue during this time, and those extra few weeks will allow us to finalize the details of the contract for the service center. Should your board elect to defer on this item, you may wish to proceed with taking public comment today, given the attendance by interested parties that are in attendance. And of course, staff would welcome any comments from your board at the conclusion of public comment. <laughs> So at this point, staff are seeking guidance on whether to proceed with introducing the ordinance or deferring the discussion and introduction until March 8th. Thank you. And County Council, you'd like to uh, say a few words? I would. Um, if the board wishes to proceed with the introduction of the ordinance, I wish to read into the record uh, some very minor uh, clarifications into the ordinance. 
Uh, you've been provided with a copy um, and you can follow along with me. I'm going to read these into the record. On page 3, uh, definition section 12.26.020. Um, I point out that uh, retired Judge Cousins actually submitted some comments yesterday that I found incredibly helpful. And I want to thank him for that and uh, read into the ordinance the revisions. Available shelter shall mean beds or other accommodations that are accessible and available to an indigent homeless individual, in parens, individual, by public, private, or subsidized transportation. And the rest of that paragraph remains the same. Under the definition of camp or camping, in the fourth line down, starting with using any tents or storing personal or striking belongings and inserting property. On page five, under section 12.26.030, we are adding the following. I'll read the sentence for you. It shall be unlawful for any person to camp, occupy camp facilities, use camp paraphernalia, or use public utilities on any county property, and we are inserting, with posted signage, and the rest remains the same. In the second paragraph of that same section, we are striking the first sentence in its entirety. That sentence for the public is county public property need not have signs posted to enforce this article. We are striking that. Essentially what this does is it's, uh, it, it, the intent of this is the enforcement of the ordinance would be based on areas that are signed for the same. The next and final uh, edit, uh, clarification is on page six. And this is uh, about a quarter, page down, a quarter of the page down, starting with nothing in this section excuses. Any, we're adding that, we are deleting indigent homeless, and we, have, uh, for, we go further with individuals. So in other words, the sentence will now read, nothing in this section excuses any excuses any individual from complying at all times with the following provisions of county code, and we list several sections. And that concludes the um, clarification on the ordinance, should you wish to proceed with introduction. I realize, uh, Karen, that uh, we've made these changes. Uh, has the public all had opportunity to see these changes? And if not, then I'm going to suggest we hear the public today and Mm -hmm. continue the item the public has not okay so I think in, in an abundance of caution um, board my recommendation would be that we uh, here take public testimony today on the revised ordinance and and the any other public comment on this item and then uh, consider bringing this back um, as a good protocol given the, the uh, significance of this issue To uh, continue it? Um, at the end, yes. maybe after public comment, or do you I, want to make it yes. now? Yeah. I, I think public comment might also help to see if there are any other further clarifications the board might want in the ordinance before you introduce it. Because under the law, you can make changes before you introduce it, but once you introduce it, if you make changes, you have to reintroduce it. Okay, great. Thanks for that clarity. Um, any questions for Becky on any of, uh, or Karen, on uh, the proposed ordinance as revised? I'm not seeing any lights on, so Becky, thank you. I know uh, many of you have been waiting. I'm sorry it takes us so long sometimes to get through our agenda items, uh, but we're opening this now up for public comments. Thank you. Good afternoon, my name is Sherry Cousins, and obviously I'm here to talk about the proposed ordinance. <clears throat> um, currently, I work in a thrift store in Auburn, and when the homeless started congregating there in DeWitt, I would bring items that we cannot or would not sell. Oops, 
sorry, sorry, <laughs> that uh, we can't sell for one reason or another. And I would take it over and I would walk out among the campers and hand out items and talk with them. And I continued to do that from day one. So it's been many, many months since I've been doing that. And obviously, unfortunately, this community, and it is a community, has grown. Um, over that time, I've come to realize that it's like any other community and that it's very <clears throat> multifaceted. And I'm going to give you, I promise, a very quick and dirty description of the various components of this community. One, you have your PTSD veterans. Then you have your hardcore substance abusers. <clears throat> you also have your mentally ill. And it's not simplistic because many of these people are also dual diagnosis individuals as well. You also have a group toward the back of this community that <clears throat> I call do not play well with others group because whenever I'm out there, they're the ones that if there's an argument or yelling or fighting or whatever, they're the ones involved in that kind of activity. Um, one day I was there and there was a gentleman who spent the entire time I was there kicking an oak tree and arguing with it. So I don't intermingle with those folks particularly. But on the other end of the camping area, you also have <clears throat> what I call the working poor. These are people, if you go in the middle of the day, who aren't visible. They're out in the community. They have jobs. They hire other people within that community to watch their stuff. You also have um, retired people who, for a variety of reasons, low Social Security, what have you, they're also in that section of the area, and several of them <clears throat> are in wheelchairs or have walkers. And you have what I call the disenfranchised youth also. You have young people that basically are out on their own, directionless. You have young people who have aged out of the foster care system and they have no support and they're out there. And they're a very good resource on what goes on in camp life. So that's a quick look at what the makeup of that is. Well, Hello. We'll, we'll give you a couple more minutes here. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Um, at any rate, my problems with this ordinance are basically twofold. One, um, they must break down all of their stuff and schlep it to this service center twice a day. And these are people who have no forms of transportation, um, so no way to take their dwelling, belonging, everything, and report there. Uh, the only way they could do it is to like commandeer grocery carts from around the area, which would make our merchants not too thrilled. The other thing is if they manage to do that, when they get there, they're only allotting for 24 people. On the way here today, I drove through there and did a count. We have 70 dwellings of one sort or another there. So when they get there, then um, the people who aren't able to get in are not going to be proverbial happy campers. And that could include, remember, that group do not play well with others. So they're going to be going into the seams of the community. And I have real concern about that because they're going to be popping up in front yards, backyards, behind businesses. And a real fear is you're going to have those people out in the brush and starting fires. And that has been a problem in Folsom. I would really like to see some sort <clears throat> of development around a controlled camping situation. Um, basically one that's monitored. Um, we need to have county services reasonably close by. We need to have law enforcement presence. It needs to be strict guidelines. Um, and, and there needs to be some kind of a homeless coordinator. Because we have a lot of agencies in the community and individuals who want to help. But right now it's quite chaotic. Um, when they show up, what they do, a lot of them contribute to the problem because they don't walk out among the people there. 
they just dump stuff and that really adds to you know the whole um, situation that's going on right there so to sum up you know we all know we're in a housing crisis we're in an opioid crisis and in the whole state of California we have three functioning mental hospitals so we're in a mental crisis and I would like to see us start somewhere that will accommodate the numbers that we're going to have to deal with thank you thank you very much And I know many of you want to speak to us. If you don't mind uh, kind of lining up and being prepared so we can get through all the public comment in a timely manner. Thank you. Hi, Annette Hi. Um Wow, that was put well, wasn't it? Yeah. Nicely done. Um, in reference to the fires, you know, something that was very interesting about that is some of the fires were actually started by other people who wanted the homeless gone. In reference to our law enforcement, uh, firefighters, um, other nonprofit organizations that work with these individuals, thank you. Um, you're climbing a mountain uh, that's difficult to get to the top of, and being, you know, stopped at, you go forward and boom, there's that brick wall. I'm tired of seeing that brick wall around because it seems to be a veil of ignorance that's holding it up. Um, yeah, my problem with this ordinance is, is it's just not good enough. Um, what it comes down to is the community has grown, okay? And ha make no mistakes, it is a community. They do come together. You do have the good and the bad, okay? I'm not standing here looking for mercy for certain individuals. I'm looking for mercy like individuals for myself who has been through hell and back when it comes to trying to find somewhere to actually live and be treated humanely. Okay? Mm -hmm. Is there a reason for that? No. Am I good to everybody I see? Do I give them my love? Yes, I do. February, Martin Luther King. Hmm, Black History Month. I believe love was the topic of his whole speech. It can change many things. Um. I heard something about the eroding state. I would consider, you know, they were, the individual was a little harsh on the board earlier in the meeting. Um, I think there are many factors that go into the eroding state of the county, not in particular this one, but all the way around the United States for that matter. Um, we need to come together as a team, work as one. When you become one, you become powerful. You become powerful in the way that you can make changes happen, have them happen in a timely manner, and maybe even have them be wise. Um, pulling all the pieces together was another thing. If we can pull all these pieces together, I believe it can be a successful program um, that can actually happen within this county. And achieving recovery. To achieve recovery, without showing this love and or some kind of peace to these individuals all the way around. Instead of fueling the hate that has actually uh, come to fruition, um, and that hate being on both ends, whether it be the drug addict in Tent City or whether it be somebody of great power with a great amount of money. Okay? Um, so I'd like to see that change. I would like to use Sacramento. Um, Nick, he was the director of the Gathering Inn here in Auburn. Uh, he seems to be having a successful program happening right now in Sacramento, uh, a tent city there. And that is monitored 24-7, uh, um, bathrooms, showers, and so on. So those people who do need to go to work will have what it takes to be a productive individual as far as within society and whatever community they live in. Really anyway. appreciate your comments. I do need to have people stick with yes. this three minute timeline. Oh, thank you, Annette. Park. Okay, yeah. great, thank you. Go ahead. Did one of you want to speak? Thank you. You're up. <laughs> I won't call numbers today. 
I was going to say good morning, but it's past that now. My name is Marcia Doty, and I thank you for allowing me to speak today. I've been a friend of Auburn's homeless for over a decade. I was involved in advocating cam the sh cam campaign, which managed to set up what is now called the Gathering Inn. Along with others, I have collected, prepared, and distributed both food and clothing to the homeless in the shelter and on the street. I have spoken before the board in the past regarding this subject. Currently, it is reported that there are 600 homeless, I got this online, in homeless people in Placer County. The number is far greater. Many are in fear of and hiding from any recognition. Folks were afraid that Auburn would be flooded by people from other towns and cities. The reality is that most of the homeless population are from here, having left our school system, obtaining work they lost, facing soaring housing prices, recruits, returning veterans. Divor I've been in the camps. I know these people, okay? So hands on. Re returning veterans, um, mm, divorce, tragic circumstances in their lives. Any one of us could end up homeless in, in this population. Right Hand Auburn and the Gathering Inn have been good answers for many, however not nearly large enough to accommodate those in need. Also, they're expensive to maintain. For the homeless, we need to reset stability and meet basic needs. I'm here today to tell you there is a viable answer, a positive solution for our homeless needs. I and others, Sue was the photographer, went met Wendy Thomas, who was the mayor of Placerville until 2018, and Art Edwards, a homeless advocate. They, they brought us to the Placerville Hangtown encampment. This model homeless encampment was successful in giving people a safe, stable environment, enabling folks to get up and get out of their situation, which was most of them. I have a letter from Ms. Thomas, Mayor of Placerville, regarding the process, logistics of creating this Placerville community of Hangtown. The need even then was paramount. They realized an out-of-the-box answer was needed. Art Edwards was instrumental in the groundwork. The camp was created to be a temporary, safe, structured environment with a sense of community and a foundation for basic needs. From there, people had access to job seeking, housing, health, and rehabilitation resources. Public service such as police, fire, and emergency appreciated this encampment because they could monitor safety and sanitation. Marsha, I do need to ask you to, to wrap up. I just you want to read it, the rest of it for me? Sue is with me? or Okay. I can read for her? Uh, how much longer do you? Oh, much less. Uh, not okay. half a page. Okay. No. Quickly, just, yeah. I have with me a complete compilation of most valuable information, including pictures from our day of discovery, along with Miss Thomas's letter. Hangtown was successful for a year or more in re-entering re the homeless. They finally had to close when they lost their lease to the property they occupied. I offer this information to those who have or would review, to those here who would review it and possibly see the application to our situation in Auburn and Placer County. If any of you are interested in this project and watching people reintegrate back into the community, please let me know. I will provide the information to you. I hope and pray the time has come 
for success taking care of our lost. Thank you again for letting me speak on this issue today. Thank you. Thank you, Marsha. Great. Next speaker, please. And I'm sorry, I'm just going to request again, try to stay with the three minutes um, for public comment. We have already indicated probably table, continuing this item for another date for public hearing. So if you don't get in all your comments, we, we're going to want the staff to meet with you and be talking about this as we develop any other revisions. So, so I should you. scratch the sermon? No. <laughs> Is it a 10 minute or a 20 minute? <laughs> I, I, I like to make light of certain difficult situations. Yes. But, uh, good morning, supervisors. Um, I'm Reverend Alex uh, da Silva Soto. I serve with the faithful people at Sierra Foothills Unitarian Universalist Church. And I'm also a resident right here in uh, Auburn Greens. And um, I appreciate the work that Becky Regan has done and Sarah Point Dexter and the call that we had last night about this ordinance. And I would like to go on record some of my assessment of this uh, ordinance. It unfortunately further criminalizes houselessness, poverty, and mental health. It forces um, our siblings, our community members to be under even greater distress and harassment that they are already experiencing. It overtaxes county human and fiscal resources, as well as CARES funds and um, also federal funding for this ordinance to be reinforced and to be sustainable, if it could ever be sustainable. Uh, it also, it's already been mentioned, but it also um, overtaxes uh, enforcement officials we would have to have individuals over there on the camp every single day and we could use their services in other places and that human resource could be used towards more effective ways of solving the problem that I also recognize and I also believe needs a solution. This uh, ordinance would most likely push residents of uh, these camps into fast food restaurants and other public spaces and we're still going through a pandemic so forcing individuals to be in enclosed public spaces it's definitely not to the best interest of our community so in in wrapping up I would like to encourage that we completely pivot from this ordinance into root cause solutions for the problems of houselessness, mental health, and poverty. There's indeed great efforts already taking place in our community, like the Gathering In and many other organizations that are present here today and are doing this advocacy and this work. And it has already been mentioned, and I'll say it again, safe camping is a stopgap measure that can be fruitful and address the major concerns about the encampments that we have in our county. And that's been successful in other places. Uh, some places have already been mentioned. And I met with some folks in Reno two weeks ago where they do have a safe camp as, as a stopgap measure. And as we move towards a uh, permanent and effective and sustainable solution for these problems of homelessness, poverty, and mental health. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Appreciate it. I first want to say that allowing people to live in the open, whether in a tent. I'm sorry, can you give us your name? For oh, the I'm sorry, Pamela Grant, and right. I live in Auburn. Thank allowing you, people to live outside is not compassionate. I also want to distinguish between the populations that are currently homeless. It's law-abiding citizens as well as drug dealers, people who might who are hiding from the law, criminals, drug use, active drug users, and people who could otherwise work but choose to use drugs instead. And to lump all the people together really creates a disservice for everyone. The ordinance claims to ensure to a goal, a safe and for the safety of the homeless community. But also, what about the safety of the law-abiding citizen? What about the safety of the people whose tax-paying citizens whose land is being used 
and perhaps degraded in a way that makes it un not useful. Um, I want to go back to further root causes, 2018, and I noticed the articles that I've been reading in the, in the Auburn Journal refer to that, Martin versus the city of Boise. One, one of the dissenting judges in that case did predict, correctly predict, that this decision will, I'm quoting, wreak havoc on local governments, residents, and businesses. As the affected municipalities of the Ninth Circuit Court become a magnet for trespassers, junkies, drug dealers, criminals, child traffickers, we in Auburn can expect an increase in already what we've seen, and I'll, I'll list some of them, trash, and I've been out to some, I've seen some of these places, and the gentleman who spoke on from Colfax on Dusty Lane, that could be in our future. Why, you know, why, why would we think that it's going to just stay contained to the far reaches of Colfax? Uh, the, the problems, trash, rotting food, human waste, diseased animals. I see dogs, maybe they're rabid, I don't know. Rampant drug use, violence, harassment of passers-by, fires, open drug use, uh, pest infestations that go along with increased, with less sanitation, there's more rodents. Um, we need to challenge this ruling. and. Uh, Chairman Gustafson, you did mention earlier that your role is advocacy. Your, it was a different issue. This Ninth Circuit Court has a 79% rate of their decisions being overturned. And although it was appealed to the Supreme Court, this, this um, Martin versus Boise decision, that doesn't preclude trying again. We need to do something so that we can really help the truly in need of help and separate them from the lawless population in our town. Thank you. Thank you, Pamela. Good afternoon. My name is Jim Johnson. Um, I appreciate the opportunity to speak today. I've read the ordinance a few times, a proposed ordinance. Uh, I was impressed at the extent to which uh, effort is made to accommodate um, the homeless population and those that are living at the DeWitt Center. Um, I strongly urge the board to take action and pass this ordinance. Uh, it's long overdue. Uh, your inaction to, to this point is a large part of why we have the problem that we have. Uh, I understand the Martin versus Boise case uh, well. Uh, we have laws. Uh, if those laws would be enforced, I, I, again, I read the ordinance. There's many references to existing ordinances that can be enforced, but I don't believe are. Uh, if they were, we would have much less of a problem. Uh, I know people personally who have sold their home that lived on Rand. They were uh, uh, so concerned about the depreciate the, the loss of their property values uh, and their safety that they have sold their home and, and left the area. Um, uh, I see these people out away from the DeWitt Center. I, I just this week I was at the what we call the Bel Air Center and there was a, a gentleman screaming violently, yelling. He was angry. Uh, he he wasn't there shopping and I suspect he came from from this area. I used to go to the DeWitt Center and drop off my card, cardboard. Uh, I, w I won't drive in there anymore, and, and I do business with the, the, the departments. So please, I urge you to take action. Have courage. Pass this ordinance. Thank you very much. Thank you. Hi, my name is Victoria Connolly. Thank you for tabling this item to today so we could be heard. My main concern with the ordinance is that you had staff recently show a PowerPoint revealing all shelter beds in the county are occupied, except for Project Room Key. No new shelter beds have been developed since 2015 when our shelter was set up here. Yet, in the ordinance, it says, any violating campers will be offered available shelter beds and services, assuming they don't leave because there are no shelter beds. They will either be um, arrested or fined daily as per the code. 
At least one regional uh, civil attorney has said he doesn't think it pr uh, complies with Boise at all. He says it's, Boise says it's cruel and un unusual punishment to take someone who's living outdoors by necessity <clears throat> because there's no shelter available and to say to that person, we're going to arrest you. He says that we who are dealing with the homeless in our communities keep saying we need to reallocate resources and deal with the underlying problems, and yet that has not been where public entities are prepared to go yet. What are the alternatives? There are solutions. Where are the national solutions found, such as a come-as-you-are shelter, such as Dr. Marbet recommended? Where are the tiny houses? Where's a warehouse that can house people in tents or trailers? Where's a campground? Where are bike storage lockers that can provide safe, keeping for, safe sleeping for one? Where are the shelters by right on SB2 properties? Where are the parking lots for people in cars? These solutions are the tip of the imagination iceberg. And also, we have studied this with task force, study committees, study groups, ad hocs. Please don't send up any more of these. It's been studied to death. It's reasonably foreseeable that our unhoused citizens will go back to county property nightly, perhaps reducing that blight, but they will go to other property, private, commercial, and municipal, transferring blight to those areas. And thus, this zoning ordinance should be reviewed under CEQA as per the Supreme Court decision that I sent you previously saying that it, uh, zoning can come under project under CEQA. What is doable is to take the $150,000 dedicated to the ordinance for cleanup and set up something like a self-regulated camp such as the one I mentioned that was in Placerville. These have been successful and are all over the country now. Please consider, in summary, uh, Reviewing this ordinance under CEQA project criteria, please consider utilizing SB2 zones. zones. Please consider self-regulated encampments, which have proved successful. Please affirm we have no more shelter beds created since 2015, and that this is a homegrown, self-imposed problem. Please set up a come-as-you-are shelter, and please consider that Placer may be sued uh, for uh, not complying with Boise. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. Jerry Cohen, 95602. Um, thank you for the compassionate ears and hearts that you have already lent to this inflammatory issue. I would like to merely add my voice to the incredibly articulate constituents that I've already heard this morning in opposition to this new ordinance, I think it doesn't provide an improvement to a desperate situation. And unless we can act proactively in improving the situation, I would urge you not, not to preemptively go ahead and toss these folks out with, without an adequate safety net, without adequate services. I would, I would uh, urge our county to look to the Miller Park project in Sacramento that uh, is apparently being organized at this time and, and with, with the active participation of Mayor Steinberg down there. Uh, I would, we have the resources here. We have the human potential here to deal compassionately with our neighbors. And I would urge you to keep that at the forefront of your decision making. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, board. Um, what, a, what a great display of the community. Um, I mean, I, I think what we're seeing here, when the community really comes together with an issue like this that um, they're very passionate on, they can very well provide the solutions that um, that county often cannot find a solution to. Um, this is close to me. This is actually my backyard, my front yard, whatever you want to call it. And um, when this first started to take place, it was very concerning because I wasn't hearing any kind of solutions behind it. Just um, let them go away during the day and they can come back at night. 
And um, if you're aware of this area behind the hospital and, um, you know, there's a pretty heavy wooded area over there, they're going to end up there. They were there before. And I know that area. I walk that area. I take my boys, you know, um, that's the back way when we walk to the park. So they're going to be back there. Um, they're not going to come and go. They're going to be in our grocery stores. They're going to be in our parking lots. They're going to be in our neighborhoods. There's actually neighbors right now preparing for this, and they're putting up security lights because they see it, it coming. Right now, um, they're in a place. It's safe. Um, it's visible. Understand, you know, there's a lot of things that, you know, go along. And, and you've heard a lot of great solutions here today. And one of the things that I want to... Um, that I haven't want to talk about that I have not heard about yet is that there's an element to the homeless that um, <clears throat> that needs to be met, and that is the spiritual element to these uh, to these you know to the homeless. You know they're down on their luck, whether their jobs or PSD, PSTD or um, drug use, or whatever the case may be, and um, and and the county can address the many issues, but when it comes to spiritual needs. That's something that the church is equipped that can handle these needs. And I would like to see a heavy partnership with the local church to get the church to get more involved because I think you will be surprised of the type of solutions that the church can come alongside the county and um, help with this issue um, as far as volunteers you know, to help maintain the camp, people to watch it and things. You know, there's all types of walks of people in the churches, whether they're law enforcement or, you know, medical backgrounds or whatever. And, and quite honestly, you know, um, like Marsha mentioned, you know, they've been working with the homeless, you know, for 10 years. You know, there's organizations out there that, you know, they build relationships. They just don't come in and drop things off. They, they, they build relationships. They talk to them. They help them. And also, I encourage each and every one of you, I will happily meet you guys out there. You know, we can spend the afternoon, walk the neighborhoods, and get to know, you know, this community because it is a community. So um, please reach out to me, and I would love to. I'll even, I'll even bring my two-year-old, my four-year-old, because that's how, you know, safe, you know, I feel it can be when you have the right relationships built with them. So thank you, and thanks, everybody here today. Appreciate it. Thanks, Jason. Hi there, um, my name's Michelle Lanier and I live off of Bell and Joker. Um, since the camp has been open, our vehicles have been broken into, things stolen off of our property. We're constantly finding drug paraphernalia on our property, which is very scary considering how deadly uh, fentanyl is. Um, our mailboxes are constantly broken into and we've called the sheriffs to remove people strung out on drugs wandering through our property, looking into my home. Um, my husband's a fireman, and he's gone a lot at night. And my two boys, before they go to bed, they're double-checking the locks on the doors and the windows. Um, it's really sad to see what's happened to our neighborhood. This is my home, and I don't want to leave. Um, so, um, but with that said, too, I, I also have a success story. Um, my uncle, who lives in Fresno, he's been addicted to drugs and alcohol his entire adult life. Um, recently, the city of Fresno has been cleaning up the streets and not allowing people to camp. Um, he was given the option to either go to jail or go to the Pavarella house to get help. And um, he has now been clean and sober for three months. This is a guy that I have never seen clean a day in his life. It's, it's pretty miraculous. So um, what I hope is that this county can come up with a solution that requires the homeless to get help, to get clean, and um, instead of just allowing them to continue to live this lifestyle in our neighborhood, um, you're endangering the people that, that live around this area. Um, so hopefully we can come up with a better solution. Um, thank you for your time. Thank you. My name's Gary Mappa. Gary. Thank you very much for hearing this today. And thank you very much for putting off the hearing till March 8th. I'm gonna open up with 
what I was going to close with. Project management. The definition of project management is the application of processes, methods, skills, knowledge, and experience to achieve specific project objectives according to the project acceptance criteria within the agreed parameters. Project management has final deliverables that are constrained to a finite time scale and budget. Putting the hearing off till March 8th is a good sign of the county implementing project management. Now I've got a few questions we might not be able to answer today but could be answered in the future. From the staff report under service center, item one, I don't know if it can go up on the board or not if you've got the staff report. And that's regarding the two sites have been identified for the service center. Next steps including finalizing a location and identifying a contractor to operate the center and monitor attendance. Can somebody from the county tell us where the two locations might be located, specific address and location, why they have not been formally established in advance of passing this ordinance and displacing these individuals. Regarding the contractor to operate the center, how will the contractor be selected and how long will it take to vet that contractor and to put out to bid the retrofitting of any service center that may be planned and not ready to put into place right now. All this should be done before the ordinance is approved and implemented. Under item two in the staff report, what is the nature of the reentry program at the Sanducci Center? If the Campus of Hope, we are looking at for three to five years. So if one of these centers is Campus of Hope, it's not gonna be here for three to five years. What is the specific location of the Auburn Prep Center? Other than one and a half miles from the county government center, does it actually have an address today where people can use it today? So is, is it in operation or do we have to wait to get it retrofitted for the use? Holy mackerel. Goes quick. Um, item four under libraries. With COVID, we don't even know if the libraries are gonna be available. Jump down to fiscal impact. Perhaps the service center should be operational and the camping ordinance implementation be conditioned upon its implementation rather than the opposite. Regional Homeless Action Plan, the ad hoc committee that was appointed in August. I did a thorough search of the Placer County webpage. I could not find any links to any agendas, minutes, reports that came out of that ad hoc committee. And that was even cited that it would be reviewed after the ordinance is put into place. That should be a tool to help us develop the ordinance. And so I would like to have that addressed. And then oh, then we did have that committee that was appointed. I Googled that committee and I don't get anything from a Google search on the contractor that was engaged to do it. I can't even pronounce the contractor's name. The Asano Fano Gotsman DBA MIG. They're an architectural firm, an engineering firm, and I don't know that they're a firm that should deal with the issues of homelessness, the mental issues, drug abuse, loss of jobs, lock, lack of housing, and all the different aspects of homelessness. Gary, can you go ahead and wrap this up? Your questions? Yes, ma'am, I'm okay. all done. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you so much, and please leave your questions. We'll get back to those uh, with staff in just a few minutes. Hello, my name is Dave Pettengill. I'm a newer resident to uh, California, 
and to Auburn. I just moved here this summer. I am the pastor at uh, Newcastle United Methodist Church, uh, and my wife actually works at the Faith, uh, Auburn Faith, as an ER nurse as well, and so she sees uh, the, the homeless community on a frequent basis. And our church at Newcastle also partners with the Gathering Inn uh, to serve those in need in the community. And I, I just want to speak up and say uh, I appreciate uh, you, your all's work and those in the community. And I also just want to emphasize that I understand that this is not, um, there are not simple solutions uh, to this. And I also understand the various opinions that have been shared here uh, this day, I said this evening, uh, this day. And uh, I was just reminded of a quote from Desmond Tutu, who said, there comes a point where we need to stop just pulling people out of the river. We need to go upstream and find out why they're falling in. Um, and I think that just points that it's, it's, it's going to be a tough, tough thing to do. Uh, this is, there are no easy cover-all solutions that would relate to every single person within that community. But I'm also reminded of the sacred worth of every single individual that lives in that community. And I just want to say whatever that I can do uh, as a pastor, a part of uh, Placer County, whatever our church can do to assist, I want you to know that we are available and willing to help uh, help this situation and help you all help the county uh, to care for, for everyone in our community. Thank you. Thank you. Were there other folks? Okay. Thank you. Good afternoon. Wayne Nader. Uh, hopefully you got, uh, I had Megan hand out what my comments are going to be, but I would like to say first that I live in North Auburn. Uh, right near, like Supervisor Holmes, I live right near this and drive by it uh, a lot every day. And I've lived there for 10 years. So I've seen this situation evolve or de-evolve, whatever you want to classify it as. Uh, so here are my comments that I'd like to share. The second law of thermodynamics says that disorder increases over time unless it's interrupted. Not only is this true physically, it is also true with human nature. Sadly, the homeless camp on the county property bears this out. In recent months, we have seen an unabated rapid increase in the number of tents and issues at uh, Bell Road and First Street. It is way past time to interrupt the, dis the disorder this is creating for the county and our community. I am in support of the ordinance that you are considering today. While it is harsh, I don't see any other way to change the course of where this is headed. The wanton destruction and theft against the county and nearby communities needs to come to an end. As it is, we are enabling their behavior. Sometimes the most compassionate thing you can do is tough love. The mistakenly perceived welcome mat needs to be pulled up. I'm hopeful that you have thought about the implications of what's going to happen once this ordinance goes into effect. Likely, rather than going through the daily struggle of taking down their tents in the morning and removing their property and then bringing it back in the evening, they will just find another place nearby where they can set up. This will probably be in wooded areas such as behind the hospital or on the Timberline property. Uh, when they were in there previously, we had at least three dangerous fires started by them. Fighting and disruptions were frequent as well. I lived through that. With the homeless uh, scattered throughout North Auburn area, it is going to be a real challenge for law enforcement. While they are in a semi-controlled contained area now, they will be anything but that if this ordinance is implemented. The sheriff's deputies will remove them from one property to only have them surface on a different property days later. It will be a futile game of hide and seek. I would like to suggest uh, that a coalition of solution-minded, solution I want to emphasize that, North Auburn residents be developed to work with your board and the Sheriff's Department to address the potential coming issues to our area once this ordinance is in force. One thought would be to issue grants uh, from the substantial funds the county just received for fire suppression 
uh, work uh, to immediately do brush removal on the wooded areas that are likely to be used by the homeless. Not only does uh, this give the campers less hiding places, it also guards against the fire dangers in those areas. Thanks for your consideration. Thank you, Wayne. Other public comment here in the room? I know we also have some on Zoom as well who would like to speak us. Good afternoon. Hello, my name is Lynn Sloan. Um, I have been a resident here in Auburn since 1974. I live fairly near, uh, near enough that it has been my joy to go there and visit with these people. Uh, I've bought 20 tents so far. If you want to complain about tents, come to me. I'm the one that's buying them because those people need them, the women in particular. We're talking about human beings here, and I think this ordinance is just going to make it more difficult for them. And so, as others have said, they'll just move to other places. Uh, they need help. And the, seeing the pictures that you've chosen broke my heart, because these are real people with real feelings. And a number of them want to improve their lives. Some of them are not at the point in their mental capacity that they can do that. Um, they need love, they need us. We could afford all of those fences that we put up, we could afford to tear down all the buildings that were there. I know that our county, being a compassionate county, can afford to help these people. They need fresh water, they need, of course, accommodations, but while they're there, let's make it more humane for them. And I know you can do that, thank you. Thank you. Before we go to Zoom, I wanted to see, is there anyone else in the room who wanted to address us? Okay. Carol, Carol go ahead and unmute your mic and give your comments. Hello? Yes, we can hear I'm you. Carol, Carol. I'm Carol Coons. I'd just like to also say that this ordinance does nothing to help solve the homeless problem, but simply, as others have said, pushes people to camp somewhere else. I speak as a person who has a close family member with substance abuse and long-term homeless problems. I know it's a difficult issue. I know it's, there are no easy answers. It's very complex. Sherry Cousins and Reverend Alex in particular have spoken so eloquently at this, about this um, issue. And I just wanna join them in opposition to this ordinance. Thank you very much. Thank you, Carol. Yes, uh, good afternoon, supervisors. Uh, my name is Virgil Nelson. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay. Um, a retired American Baptist pastor and active class of people are faced together. Uh, we really do, as an organization, want to express our appreciation to you for the effort that uh, staff and the board has put into moving this far and discussing the issues around camping at the DeWitt Center and other locations in the county. Um, we realize the incredible diversity of the folk who make up the camp, as uh, was shared earlier by Sherry today in, in enumerating at least five different subgroups that make up the resident uh, on the DeWitt campus. So there's no one easy solution. and. We as an organization would like to express our commitment to work with you and staff to explore alternatives, especially including the possibility of creating a location where it would be legal, in fact, to camp. Uh, there are a variety of different models that are available. Uh, we do not have to reinvent the wheel. Some of them are local, as has been mentioned with uh, the Hangtown Haven. Uh, there are churches very much involved in Denver, working with the local uh, organizational uh, administrative structures to uh, create and also supervise camps. So the models are there, and we really just want to commit to encouraging you to uh, think about creative alternatives that will address the bigger picture. So thank you very much for your time and energy. Thank you, Virgil. Lynette, go ahead and unmute your mic and give your comments. 
Hi, good afternoon. Thank you for having me. Um, I wanted to speak in regards to the Boise case, and I'm not sure who interprets that case, but it says that you cannot cite someone that is homeless for illegal camping unless there is an available shelter for them. It does not require Placer County or any county for that matter to build a shelter or buy a $17 million hotel. I'm not understanding how nobody can see the plan that, that's being implemented here. It's one big project plan coming down from the federal government. And this is a perfect example of what I spoke about earlier in regards to the strings that are attached. Why don't we go back to basics and let the people that are equipped to handle the homeless, I mean, we've had homeless since I can remember in Placer County and across this nation, and they always attended the churches. The churches have volunteers. They have people that can minister to the homeless and help them on a faith level. They also know how to provide for them. Additionally, if you pass this ordinance, you're going to push people to camp in other places such as your neighborhood, my neighborhood, all of the people that are in that audience today, it's gonna to push them into their neighborhoods, to their front yards, to their backyards, to your parks where my children go to play. You cannot mask the symptoms, you have to treat the root cause. And if we continue to mask the symptoms and follow the guidelines of the federal government, because again, you took the blood money, then the, the, the progressive agenda is going to continue to grow and our community, as wonderful as it is today, is going to look like San Francisco tomorrow and LA County the next day after that. It's going to get worse and worse and worse. And I'm not sure why nobody can connect the dots here to see exactly what's happening on a larger scale. I mean, it seems to me like CNN is on TV 24 seven over there. It's like the talking points of a large implementation plan that is taking place. And I don't understand why nobody can see it. It boggles my mind. So please reread the Boise case. Have somebody like a good attorney interpret that case for you because it doesn't say that you have to purchase land. It, you may, why, don't, why doesn't Placer County donate some land in a more rural area to where a church can set up and, and do like a, maybe a tent city for the homeless and provide for them? Thank Annette, you. Annette, can you give us your name for the record? Lynette, thank you. Lynette, thank you. Cheryl, go ahead and unmute your mic and give your comments. Thank you. Um, good afternoon. I would like to follow on what the uh, previous speaker just said about connecting the dots. Um, there are a lot of solutions out there. The audiences have been identified. Placer County is a $1.5 billion business, if you look at it that way. You have the resources, you have the connections with all of the local jurisdictions. You have connections with Caltrans, you have Health and Human Services. You should be the one connecting the dots. Why we would put out to a vendor to connect the dots, vendors should be utilized to provide certain aspects of a solution, but the solutions have not been identified. It is not enough, and I encourage you to look at Sacramento. The district attorney and the sheriff's department may be suing, and also American River was a place where a lot of the people were hanging out, and now they want to have be in Fair Oaks, and at least they are in a safe environment. You have a safe environment, yet, this ordinance is kind of like not in my backyard, Placer County campus. So I encourage you, you have trash collection, you have a somewhat safe environment until solutions are identified. I encourage you to allow the people the respect and to have, until you can come up with your own solutions, create a matrix. Where is Caltrans? Why there's no seems to be no public communication from the supervisors as to 
who is responsible for what and who is supposed to fix what part of the problem. That, I believe, falls on you. And I, I appreciate that the CEO's office is putting this off, but we look to you to provide that matrix with each group that is identified and to identify what is the solution for each group. What can you at least move forward with? What is a matter of money? But I think you have the capabilities and yet pushing them pushing those problems out to the residents. Residents don't have these capabilities to deal with it. There was a post on social media that I'd like to bring your attention to where several individuals wanted to go clean up. There's camps now on Douglas and 80, between uh, Douglas and Eureka on Highway 80. People are cutting fences. People don't know who to call. Oh, Caltrans has been called. Well, how would we know this? You have the capabilities to network with all these individual parts of government to pull the solution together. Um, I think rather than discourage different solutions, it, we look to you for that advice. We want to go out and actually clean up some of these camps, but we can't even do that because nobody knows who's in charge, what's legal, what can we do. We're looking to the CEO's office to develop those solutions. Thank you. Thank you, Cheryl. Okay, so we don't have any further public comment um, before, <coughs> excuse me, Karen, before we uh, take that up. I do have some questions, and I neglected to call on our law enforcement and probation departments to come forward. Um, I will start with one question, which is, we heard this in January because of the growth in problems we were having out there. It wasn't a status situation. We were seeing that maybe a camping ordinance was our next step after years of study. I'd love to hear from you. Um, you've heard from some of the public here today and if you had any clarifications from what you've heard and also the efforts you're taking. So. Hi, Lieutenant Connie Schmidt. Um, I've been the supervisor for our HLD homeless liaison team for the past year and a half, uh, approximately. I've been working closely with the deputies and the sergeant that have been out there, boots on the ground, um, assisting these people. We also work in conjunction with HHS and probation. Um, we have been out there talking to these individuals, providing services um, with our collaborators, trying to get these people um, to resolve what their issues are, to move forward, to get the services. Um, there are several people out there um, that just refuse it. It's easy for them to stay out there and just do what they're doing. Um, I understand the concerns of the people here today, um, and we're working closely with everyone that's involved to try to provide those solutions. A lot of the concern I'm hearing is that people are worried about them being pushed out into other areas, and what are we going to do about that? There's laws for trespassing that are in place that we can use. Um, right now, there's no laws for the things that are happening at, at DeWitt with the illegal camping or the, the camping situations that are going on there. Um, we want to move forward. We want to help these individuals. We are very concerned and sympathetic for, for each individual's concern. But when these people don't want services, where are our hands? We, they're tied. There's nothing that we can do at this point. There's no no violations, no infractions, nothing that we can enforce to actually get them into services. I heard a comment earlier that um, with the individual that stated that her uncle, you know, was given an option, either go to jail or get services. If, if that's an option or, uh, you know, services that we can provide for these people, it, it might em empower them and better them in, in their future. So. Thank you. I appreciate that. Did any of the other board members have any questions? Supervisor Holmes. Thank you, uh, Lieutenant. Um, do we have any idea how many of those folks that are camping out there are actually Placer County residents? Um, the population is kind of ever-changing and ever-evolving. Um, I would say maybe about 30 to 40 percent. Um, you know, we've, we've heard uh, people that have come as far away as from Tennessee and that are just camping out there. Okay. And then you say that several people just don't want services. And there's no way that anybody can require someone to go through treatment or uh, mental health treatment if they refuse correct we, we can't we can't force people to do that correct so that's part of part of our challenge all right yes. thank you 
Great. Any other questions? Thank you, and okay. thanks for all the hard work out there. Thank you for your support. Mm -hmm. um, and then any questions for uh, other staff? Oh, Marshall, yes. Sorry. I thought you forgot about me. No, no, I wouldn't forget about you. It's all ready for you. Um, first, the easy question. 1915 Grass Valley Highway, Suite 400 is our Auburn Prep Center. Um, for those of you familiar, it's right behind the Dodge and Jeep dealership next to State Parole. There's a little strip mall right there, and it's in one of those buildings. So hopefully that answers your questions. I'll be happy to take any additional questions um, after if you have any more. Um, in regards to our services, I mean, probation is a balance between accountability and, 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 and services. Um, I would like to just point out that, you know, my philosophy in being the chief for over the last 10 years is, is we want to have successful cases. And those are cases that come before us and we never see again. Because somewhere along the line, we got them the right services, we got them the right tools to help them succeed. And those are our favorite cases. Um, so over the years, with your board's support and our community support and actually the support of the Placer People of Faith who were here during parole realignment and all of those changes and participated in all of our groups, um, we developed the Placer Reentry Program. Um, that was part of the um, Master Criminal Justice Master Plan back in the day. Um, and it is available now in Roseville, Auburn, and in Tahoe. It has an array of services. There are, many of them are listed on there on the, on the board memo. But we provide as many services as possible for anyone, regardless of their probation status. So you don't have to be on probation or parole to get these services. Because I take that philosophy as a simple approach. Um, we want to help anyone and everyone in Placer County. And we are prepared to do that. I do also want to note that we have a, a, a construction training program uh, where individuals can get full construction um, uh, certifications in different types of fields, welding and, and construction and sheetrock and all those kinds of things at the Auburn Fairgrounds. That's also free of charge for anybody who wants to, um, to become involved in that as well. We've had some great success stories there. We also have our probation outreach vehicle um, supported by your board, one of our newest endeavors. Uh, happy to report that that's a work in progress. It will become a full probation, a mobile probation office, which we are out there in the community seeing individuals, providing those services that they desperately need. Um, sooner or later, we're going to have an opportunity to have um, a court from that vehicle, so we can bring court to this community to help them get through their legal obligations. But I also think it's important to note that in the last, um, I don't know, several months, we've been out um, in the community with our homeless liaison teams. HHS, Sheriff's Department, probation officers, engaging this community. And when I say engage in this community, um, countywide, since late October, we've had 500 contacts. Now I say they're contacts with people, engaging them, trying to get them into services. In Auburn alone, in the last eight weeks, we've had 160 contacts up in the DeWitt Center, driving around and parking our new vehicle out there. People can come in and see us. They can get services. There's a practitioner there. There's referrals to our reentry program, to our construction training program bus passes. Um, we are prepared to do whatever we can because at the end of the day, like I said earlier, we want success and that's the case that never came to us. Um, and so those are just some of the services that we provide here and I hope it helps with your decision. Appreciate that. Any questions, board members? No, Mar Marshall, I've seen the success of that prep, prep program and it's really, really valuable. And uh, I've seen the graduations uh, and all the training that uh, those people, men and women, in the, in, in the trades from HVAC to welding and all electric, electricians and that. So, uh, and I'm glad that it's at the uh, Gold Country Fairgrounds in Auburn. It's not the Auburn Fairgrounds. Yes. <laughs> okay. Just Gold Country. About thank it. you very much. All right, thank you. All right, thanks. And Marshall, yes. I just want to, again, thank you. And, and I think you're describing a foundation for where the, the the answer lies it's it's not a simple thing it's not one thing uh, but it's going to take efforts like yours that combine with others and the courage by the board and city council members frankly to, to really step up with something together that makes a lot of sense and is comprehensive so thanks yes thank you very much thank you thanks Marshall Becky, uh, were there any other questions or comments in public testimony that you wanted to address right now? 
Well, I think something that might be helpful for staff as we move forward, if we are going to come back on March 8th um, to reintroduce the ordinance at that time, if you have any guidance for us on whether we should set up a uh, community discussion group with some of the folks that are represented here today and if that would focus in the North Auburn area and then what types of information would be helpful to bring back to your board um, from those conversations. Thank you, Becky. Um, and I know there were some questions on the task force as well that I would ask my counterparts who serve on that committee to maybe address quickly for Mr. Mappa because he did ask a number of questions about the task force that we are leading. <laughs> yeah, uh, Supervisor Gore and I serve on that. Uh, the phase one, uh, we've had several meetings. Uh, unfortunately, they're all online, so you don't really have a chance to really get down to the nitty gritty with some of these folks. Uh, but the phase one is out for comment. Uh, I have a copy of that, I can share that. Uh, and then we're trying to, actually the representatives from the cities, there's two council members from each city and uh, two from the town of Loomis uh, that are involved. But uh, there's really, at this point, there's really not any consensus about how we move forward. I think, um, and I've mentioned in our meetings that this safe camp program would be valuable It'd be regulated, as uh, Ms. Cousin said, it'd be regulated, uh, structured. There would be, you know, protocols and everything where people had to follow the rules. The question is, where do we put it? And I don't think at this point any of the cities are willing to allow that in their jurisdiction. Uh, but I would be open to looking at, at that uh, perhaps somewhere in the Placer County Government Center, but everybody looks to us to solve this problem when it's a countywide uh, problem. And so uh, the uh, uh, members of the task force or the ad hoc committees are looking to meet, meet again to kind of get down to exactly where we're at moving forward. So we really don't have any solution. If I could add on Supervisor Holmes to your comments, there are uh, we are finalizing the dates with our consultants to come oh. back to each jurisdiction to present the highlights from that phase one work, mm -hmm. which was really to identify a number of strategies for future consideration and discussion and specifically for outreach with the constituents to gain some of their input and, um, and perspectives on some of these issues. We can be sure to publish those dates. Um, your, your board uh, requested to be briefed last on that so that you could understand the comments that had been provided at each of the city councils and their, um, their deliberations of these, of these uh, concepts. So we can certainly publish those dates. Folks are welcome to um, attend uh, that, that meeting and share their perspectives again um, and to weigh in on their thoughts around the phase one findings. And what we have out there now is just uh, not working. It's unregulated. People come as they are. Uh, I, I was talking to one of our uh, Placer County fire captains uh, just the other day about how's it, how's it going out there. Uh, and he says, well, you know, we're out there probably two, maybe three times a day. And he said he shared with me an individual that was in a tent that thought it would be a good idea to have a propane tank inside their tent. Well, what could go wrong? It caught on fire. And this, this woman was burned severely and she had to go down to Roosevelt. I don't know where she is now, but those kinds of things are occurring out there. And you know, there are people that are homeless who choose to be homeless. And there, some of those people are out there because they have mental illness. And then their solution is to self-medicate, which causes two problems. So you gotta, you gotta recover from your self-medication and then try to get recover from your mental illness. There's not enough hospitals. There are just not enough services out there to help these folks that need service. And if there, if there were more, there's still people that aren't gonna take care of them. They don't wanna get caught up in the system. And in order to, survive, to come out of that, what they're living is a lot of work. They've gotta do a lot of work. And it's just not a 30 day stay in some kind of uh, institution to stabilize you, you're back out on the street again or wherever you go, and it's a revolving door. And so it's a very, very challenging uh, challenge for us. Uh, we've just got to look for ways to management. And again, uh, if we can find more than one area for a safe camp, there's some examples. Uh, I think the city of Denver has some that I've seen uh, recently. Uh, those are 
those are options for people that are unhoused that are willing to live by the, some rules and keep them safe. And so it's gonna be a tremendous challenge. Supervisor Gore. Uh, thank you. I, first of all, I wanna say I really appreciate the comments, the thoughtful comments, and this is certainly a challenging issue. Um, I wanna thank Ms. Burkema for her comment about the county taking leadership uh, because I, I, I believe that this homelessness task force that we've been working at the last six months is an, an overall effort to work with our city partners to look at overall solutions and that we can work together in the future. Now the challenge is we have an issue now, right? And it's very clear that there's an issue out, out that we've got going on at the DeWitt Center. I think we, we've heard from you all and what we have to do is balance safety with compassionate accommodation and accountability. And, and accountability right? So we're concerned about people being safe either at the government center as well as in our neighborhoods. Uh, we have clearly a problem with not enough places for people to live. We do not have enough shelters and we've got people camping. So I think we do have to look at some type of compassionate accommodation, some type of controlled camping with strict guidelines. I think that that's something that we can look at, but we also have to have accountability. So those folks that don't wanna participate, being able to have a camping ordinance that allows for people to move on who are not going to uh, be accountable, then we have that option as well. So um, I do think that in, with the effort that we're doing with the Homeless Task Force, we really have to look at this government center and say, are there some things that we can do um, in addition to a camping ordinance, excuse me, in addition to the no camping ordinance, you know, is there something that we can do to have some reasonable accommodation for folks um, while we're in the long-term process? of future um, additional shelters um, and transitional housing, et cetera. So it's an overall plan, but we clearly have an issue now that we need to continue moving forward with. I appreciate uh, the offer of let's, let's work with our local partners in the, in the city of Auburn as well. Uh, what are some things that we can do sooner than later um, to address the problems on this campus? And it's clear that we have them and it's clear that we have different opinions and not everyone is going to be satisfied but i think it's very clear that our board is looking at um, trying to to find some reasonable solutions in this area thank you bonnie suzanne yes thank you <clears throat> i just want to mention that everyone is talking about the problem up at the dewitt center the homeless population as you all know is growing and growing um, in the last two weeks we've had um, homeless encampments now popping up along douglas boulevard in granite bay they're all back in the uh, little forested um, open areas and of course they've mentioned over there off of um, near eureka and highway 80. and so it's not just a dewitt issue it's growing and it's moving it's like a cancer and I know everybody keeps talking. We've been, how long, how long have people been talking about solutions? That's all we, it seems like that's all we are ever able to do is just talk about it. So I think that we need to really start talking some hard solutions. Not everybody's gonna be happy with them, but we've got to try to figure out how to get these folks off the street. The one thing I do know is the law says, if you don't have beds to put them in, then our law enforcement folks cannot go out there and say, hey, you can't be here. Pick them up, drive them over to the facility. If there are no beds, they can't touch them. They have to leave them there camping, wherever they are. So I just think that now that we've got the problem growing down in our area, that uh, it's gonna be getting worse in everybody's district. So I think we really need to please come, give us your ideas to resolve homelessness some solutions, what can we all do? I know not everyone is going to be um, reachable, I guess, but we have to do our best. And I think we have a good, a good team and a good staff, so thanks. Thank you. Uh, I, I would, um, I have a couple of comments. One is, um, I think it's important whenever we have so many people in the public 
in attendance and paying attention to an issue that we make sure to to tell the whole story of the investment the county has been making. And I did ask Dr. Oldham yesterday, staff did, to kind of give me an idea of what we're spending. Uh, Health and Human Services is a quarter of our total budget of this county. And of that, he estimates 11 million at a minimum up to maybe 14 million. He said several million in direct services on trying uh, to deal with homelessness. On top of that, the rest of his program is devoted to trying to assist people that are in need and providing many other services. So I think it's critical. I, from the day I stepped into this chair, I can tell you the um, faith-based organizations are critical they have been providing the lion's share of the efforts on overnight, in, in especially in South Placer. And uh, programs like our Auburn Interfaith Food Closet, all of these programs, I, I commend our citizens who are stepping up and doing so much to help us try to solve this. We don't have the answers up here, clearly. Uh, no one in the state seems to have the model for how you help people change their lives. Um, but we're trying. And I, what I like about the ordinance was that the sheriff also had discretion to make judgment calls because so much of it, as we heard, is based on the individual and what their challenges are and what can best serve them. Um, but we do have to have, provide safety. Public safety is critical to our residents and to the rest of the people on the site. They want to be safe there too. And we've had incidents where they're not safe on the site. So uh, I urge us to continue with the ordinance uh, to form the task force or, or you know, meet with the individuals, especially those uh, that are willing to participate in, in problem solving this. We have tremendous resources right now. The state is providing even more resources we have done our room key and now our home key programs, trying to find more housing in those. And uh, you know, personally, I've really been encouraged with the Gathering Inns Campus of Hope, but where does it go? And that seems to be the biggest stumbling block there. Um, and so we, we need to, that is gonna be a tough decision, and I urge us all to be working together on solving the solution for where we have a come as you are shelter, a low barrier shelter so people can uh, get assistance. This board, I think, spoke in January, for those of you who weren't with us that meeting, and was very compassionate to trying to solve this problem and not just for today. We need to prevent it. That's what our HHS department is doing and our child protective services are doing, our law enforcement is doing. We're all putting a tremendous amount of time into this and um, I, I just, I want us to be successful. If we're innovators in forest, how much better would it be to be innovators in human lives? So uh, I just urge us to go that way. Becky, did you need other direction from us? Because we've all been here for a few hours now. <laughs> um, no, I don't, I don't believe so. I think we're fine for now. But just confirming you would like staff to return on March 8th with to reintroduce the ordinance that yes time. and i think karen you wanted to make an announcement or guide us a little better than i'm doing yes i'd, I'd recommend that you move to continue this item to march 8th at 10 5 a.m okay do we need a motion to that okay do i okay second and then i have a couple of comments i wanted to make too okay do yeah. you want to go just first wrap or? up yeah uh, yeah if i could or doesn't matter if I'm just go ahead go ahead i i just you, somebody mentioned today comments made by uh, Desmond Tutu and talked about uh, trying to get upriver to look at the problems that are being caused before somebody's in the river uh, and uh, in more trouble and more difficult to uh, to assist. That, that's the that's Placer County's Health and Human Services model. We actually have special state enabling the legislation which allows us to do that. And actually, when HHS did a retreat to define that model. They actually have a chart that showed people falling into a river and then falling over a, a waterfall and it shows that uh, state and federal directives are 
that you focus on the folks who have already fallen over the waterfall. But in Placer County, we are much better positioned to be innovative and entrepreneurial on this issue. But I, I, I just want to emphasize that it's going to take the kind of things that Marshall described where they're multifaceted, they're comprehensive. It's going to require working in partnership with our cities. And I think those of us who are elected uh, have to be willing to try uh, different things and be willing to have some small failures along the way, much like we did with the shelter in Auburn that had some great success, but I think now is facing some different challenges that need adaptive management also. So I just would hope that all of us would be willing to have those kinds of conversations and, and take some risk along the way. We're not going to get it right. Um, we're going to stumble, but I think we have a great chance here to do something different and innovative. Thank you, Robert. Um, I had one more comment on direction to staff real quick before we vote. Um, how quickly, if, if we had come back with an ordinance that won't please everyone but tries to help address it, if there's unintended consequences that we haven't yet anticipated or loopholes, how quickly can we amend or change that ordinance after an ordinance is adopted? Or can we write that into the ordinance to provide that? Um, I, I'm not sure which, yeah, I think I know what you mean by unintended consequences. What's difficult is- Going into neighborhoods, uh, impacting oh, other areas that we can't control, other- Really, it, it would be hard to write an ordinance that says, I mean, we have normal trespass laws. Mm -hmm. And for private property, uh, private property owners can enforce under the private trespass mm -hmm. laws. So it's hard to write an ordinance that is trying to think of consequences that haven't happened. Because really an ordinance is there to provide and it has to be in a form that is, is understandable and clear. And when you start to speculate mm -hmm. on consequences, you don't have a clear ordinance. So that's a little difficult, but let me... But changing the ordinance then after ah, the fact. Yes. So an ordinance, if, if it comes back on the 8th and if it's introduced, it would come back two weeks later for adoption. It's uh, effective 30 days thereafter. Um, the board can, uh, frankly, after it's introduced, if the board chooses not to adopt it, that's always um, an option for the board. If after it's adopted, for example, and you're within 30 days and we suddenly realize that the board would prefer to change something, we can bring an ordinance during that effective period that would nullify the other one. So that there are, of course, then it's introduction, two weeks, and then 30 days. So we have always have the option to bring another ordinance at any point in time. So it might take us up to six to eight weeks to modify something as we monitor what the outcome is if we were to pass an ordinance. Yes, I mean, I think, and I think it all depends too on, on what the change might be. Some changes are easy to make. Some changes, as the board knows, you make one change and it suddenly becomes a domino effect within the ordinance that we have to take into account and change other areas because you need an internally consistent ordinance to pass muster. So it's really hard to answer that, um, but- But you did, I, I just wanted to give uh, folks an idea of the, the process yeah. that when we adopt ordinances, and we said this recently on another um, volatile item we were dealing with, um, that we need to monitor, we need to watch what occurs, sometimes intended, sometimes unintended consequences of those actions and make sure we're flexible enough to come back and modify and address those to our communities. Absolutely, so. I mean, I think we, within the board's police power, the ability to modify an ordinance is always there and always available to the board yeah. at any given time. Well, I appreciate that. I know sometimes people feel our actions are, are forever and uh, obviously we have a lot of flexibility to bring it back. If I could add a couple of comments on, on that. Um, one of the ideas behind introducing this ordinance is to really build on a lot of evidence-based practices um, that have, and lessons that have been learned around things such as drug courts, homeless courts, mental health courts. And it's, the idea is to establish an accountability framework. That's what this ordinance does. 
within the guidelines of this ordinance, um, I would remind the board that at your direction, we've included um, exemptions and that the sheriff's office is empowered to develop exemptions as they think are appropriate. There's also um, a fair amount of discretion for the county executive to um, advise and direct on implementation and process pieces within the ordinance. So we could develop um, some performance criteria, keep track of service calls, keep track of some material um, information that we could bring back and share with your board, and then also work within our office to, um, to uh, enact some change. The Sheriff's Office has already volunteered that they will be increasing and expanding their patrol in North Auburn. Um, once the ordinance goes into place, but we could keep track of those types of things um, and, and bring them back to your board for further consideration. Thank you, Becky. Karen? You know, the other thing I would point out, too, is that, that and in fact, we even codified it in this, the, uh, wrote it into this ordinance, but it bears uh, mentioning again that we have two, three, we have five different ordinances currently on the books. We have the, the animal control, we have the littering, the possession of, of open containers, urinating and defecating in public places, and fires. Nothing in the Boise decision says we can't enforce those. We can enforce this right now without this anti-camping ordinance. And uh, I know one individual mentioned, you know, that that particular issue, and I just want to make sure that's on the record, that these can be enforced and should be enforced. Right. And I know our, our Sheriff's Department is working on that and has tried um, as well. So thank you. Um, so the motion and a second is on the table to continue this item to March 8th at, I'm sorry, what time? 10.05. 10.05 a.m. Um, and we will take a vote on it. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Thank you all very much. I know it's been a long afternoon and wait. Uh, appreciate all the testimony today. We have two more quick, I think they're quick items. Uh, so first we will go uh, to item 11, the short-term rental ordinance adoption. And then we will take our lunch break after that in our closed session. So. I'll let county staff come up. You may want to say one more time that we're continuing the one Well, I think we'll get there like in two seconds. What? I think we'll get there pretty quick. Oh, and again, I just want to remind anyone who's here for our 11:30 timed item, I uh, 1:30 timed item, that we will be continuing that item. Okay. No worries. No Great. Worries. Thank you. Well, good afternoon again. Uh, I'll get started here. Cindy, she's asking about the continuation. Yes, that is 130 item. When will that be continued to? Staff, can you, uh, I'm sorry, Stephanie, hold no on a moment. We were just making a quick announcement on that. Chair, we're at one minute if you want to just yeah. wait till the 130 and then we can just move the item and set it. Okay. The recommendation, uh, my understanding, and council, feel free to jump in at any point, is the recommendation is to move the item to the May 10th board meeting and we at a one o'clock time slot. But I don't May think the 10th board at one. We can't take that action until 1.30, so if you give us, uh, it looks like, about 45 seconds, we'll be able to hear that item. I am sorry for this. We did announce it earlier, but um, that item took a while. And we're officially at 1.30, Chair. Okay, we're officially at 1.30, so uh, who's going to uh, make the announcement on this item? You just did, but let's make it again officially. So the board... Sorry about that. The board would need to take a motion to continue this item to the May 10th board meeting at 1 p.m. Do I have a motion? Second. I'm going to give this one to Wygant and second to Holmes. How's that? Uh, yeah. Okay, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Again, my sorry for any inconvenience to any of you. We made the announcement a while ago, but you may not have caught that. So now we'll go to our final item of the day. Item 11, County Executive Report on the Short-Term Rental Ordinance Adoption. 
Yeah, so good, good afternoon, um, Chairman Gusterson, members of the board again, Stephanie Holloway with the CEO's office in Tahoe. Um, so I'm pleased to bring this item on short-term rentals back to your, uh, cons for your consideration this afternoon. I am joined again by Crystal Jacobson in our uh, community development um, agency up in Tahoe as well. So she's gonna, she and her team are really gonna be instrumental um, if your board ad adopts the ordinance changes and bringing forward the implementation. So I'll, I'll talk a little bit about that, but uh, we're both here for questions. Uh, so as you know, uh, we're here today to um, propose a, a new ordinance on short-term rentals. It is a repeal and replace of the existing ordinance, uh, Article 9.42 uh, of our county code. Um, and again, we believe this really brings us for, uh, closer to really finding a balance within our community um, around short-term rentals, around um, you know, achieving and, and potentially uh, facilitating a, a attainable, affordable uh, housing for our workforce and also uh, maintaining neighborhood character, uh, concerns that we heard around nuisance issues related to short-term rentals. Um, the ordinance was introduced uh, before your board at the last board meeting on January 25th. Uh, your board really expressed a desire to bring forward a cap or a limit on the number of short-term rental permits that we would issue uh, under this new ordinance. Um, and so we walked through that methodology, but um, just for a summary here, it was really based on uh, the current inventory of short-term rental activity that we were experiencing uh, this fall. Um, you know, looking to potentially renew short-term rental permits, people that had short-term rental permits, people that had approved uh, exemptions under the current ordinance, uh, and then also providing an opportunity for people uh, that may have been renting without a permit to bring them into compliance with the ordinance, uh, and then also um, those that uh, were affected by the moratorium, which is currently still in place, uh, looking for a new permit. So providing them the potential for an opportunity there. So. Uh, the proposed ordinance does include a cap of 3,900 permits, um, as well as several uh, updates and changes really, uh, like I said, around nuisance issues and to uh, promote tightening of the ordinance. So um, I want to talk a little bit about next steps. Um, if your board does uh, cho choose to adopt the ordinance, uh, the new ordinance today uh, would be a 30-day effective noticing before implementation. Um, that would occur March 11th. Um, at that point, the new ordinance would be enforceable. Uh, I do want to point out at that point, we will still be under the moratorium on new permits. So March 31st is the end of that moratorium. Uh, the ordinance itself and the rules and regulations um, would go into place on March 11th. Uh, the moratorium would extend then a couple of weeks past that. Um, we would start accepting uh, permits, processing renewals, processing new permits for the exempted properties um, on April 1st. Uh, again, we, we outlined sort of the priority for those permits moving forward at the last board meeting. Um, the renewals and the exempted properties would have a 90-day window essentially to come in under that priority to receive a permit under the new system. Um, we would also be taking in new applications at that point, but um, like, I, like I mentioned, we would be processing the renewals and the, um, and the exemptions uh, as first priority. I will mention that fire inspections will be required this next year. Uh, the ordinance does require that an inspection of the property uh, occur within 12 months after the adoption of the ordinance. Um, so we have um, been talking with the fire districts just around providing uh, support for that, uh, that workload and those resource needs. So let me talk a little bit about the implementation plan. Um, Crystal and her team are really um, developing and, and already sort of working forward on an implementation plan, uh, expanding the STR program potentially with some new staff uh, to cover operations. So we know there's a huge permit load potentially that would occur under this new ordinance, uh, as well as increased enforcement. Um, like I mentioned, some, some increased services for fire inspections uh, and permit processing. So. Uh, should your board choose to go forward with this ordinance today, we do anticipate uh, coming back with some staffing resource requests uh, at the February 22nd uh, board meeting. Uh, in, in addition to just the overall operations of this ordinance, um, we are looking at um, you know, advancing some of the strategic goals that your board discussed um, two weeks ago, um, talking about adaptive management, uh, tracking data, tracking economic data, tracking um, sort of these industry practices that we're seeing and evolving, uh, as well as workforce housing, 
hotel units um, and overall just enforcement data. Uh, I will mention we were having some preliminary discussions about a, a task force, a stakeholder task force. So that's part of our sort of our strategic goals. And then ultimately uh, reporting back to your board on an annual basis um, and potentially refinements of the ordinance as, as, uh, as necessary. I'll mention that we are uh, looking to go live, so go live with a new system for applying for permits, really trying to streamline uh, the processing of those permits. Um, we will be transitioning to that new system on March 18th. So they're, um, you know, just, just making sure that that data is, is known. Um, if there's any transfers that may still be out there under the moratorium, we will be transferring our technology system come March 18th. Um, and then the other thing I just want to mention under processing um, permit fees, we do anticipate the potential need for an update to our permit fees. So that's another item that we're working on for February 22nd. Uh, I will mention just a little bit of outreach moving forward. Um, we are looking to do a number of um, potentially community meetings uh, to get the word out, to really talk through this process uh, with the community, uh, with the uh, North Lake Tahoe Resort Association, the Downtown Associations, really trying to um, infuse back into the community to make sure that all the questions are answered. We're getting a lot of traffic uh, after last board meeting, um, just a lot of details. And so we want to make sure we're out there uh, in the community answering those things. Um, we're also looking at putting together a webinar, um, walking through the online tool with the community and those interested in that uh, as well. Um, I already mentioned adaptive management. So in order to be brief here, I'll just um, state the requested action. We're asking your board to adopt the ordinance, which was introduced on January 25th, 2022, to repeal and replace Chapter 9, Article 9.42 of the Placer County Code uh, to regulate short-term vacation rentals. And with that, happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Stephanie. Um, any questions, board members? I'm not seeing any up here. Are there any public commenters on this item? There is. Jamie, go ahead and unmute your mic and give your comments. Hello, how is everyone? <clears throat> can you hear me? Yes, we can. My questions are, how many permits are active right now? Because she said there was a cap of 3,900. Continue, uh, give all your comments and then we'll come back to answer questions. And that is the moratorium going to apply, not the moratorium, the reissuing, does ever, I am a short-term rental owner. I do Airbnb out of my home. And do I have to reapply every year? And is there a chance that I will not be renewed? Those are my two big questions. Thank you, Janine. And we'll, and we'll take all public comment and questions and then come back to those. Beth, go ahead and unmute your mic and give your comments. Uh, hello, yes, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, so I just had a question. I know that um, I'm a short-term rental uh, holder and um, I, I currently have a permit and I was wondering if it's a plan to track the, um, by, by changing the rules and making it, uh, limiting the number of short-term rental permits, are there, is there a plan to track long-term rentals to see if this actually does in fact to make uh, more housing stock for local community? Thank you, and your name for the record again? I'm sorry? Your name for the record? Uh, my name is Beth Sauer. Okay, Beth. S -A -U -E -R. Great, we'll, we'll get back, staff is here, they'll answer all the questions at the end here. Thank you. Jeff, go ahead and unmute your mic and give your comments. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Great, thank you. Um, just real brief, I just wanted to um, share, um, just to advocate for the existence of short-term rentals just by sharing my personal experience briefly. Um, I grew up in the South Bay and spent a lot of time in the mountains in Arnold, California, in a place my dad built. And so probably the best memories of my mom and dad and my family took place there. Um, as a result, like it's been a dream of mine to provide my kids and my family with the same kind of experience. Um, so a few years ago, my wife and I started looking in North Tahoe. And then last March, we um, were f fortunate enough to be, be able to buy a fixed rubber in Kings Beach. 
Um, so before making the purchase, you know, I did a thorough financial analysis to make sure we could afford it. Um, you know, the debt we had to take to get it and to do the work and for me to take work off as a general contractor to focus on the renovations um, were substantial. But um, at that time, the moratorium was not in effect. And so I knew we could do it um, if we had the ability to short term rent occasionally, you know, to, to slowly pay off the debt over time. Um, you know, without the ability to short term rent it, I don't see how we'd be able to keep it. We probably would be forced to sell um, and lose lose that dream that I have, at least of, um, for my family. Um, and I just like to point out that, you know, if we did sell it, we would make a lot of money. But it's not about the money for us. It's more about um, creating the memories um, as a family, and that short term renting um, on occasion would allow us to do that. So thank you for your time. Thank you, Jeff. There's no further public comment, so I'll close that time. And then, staff, do you have some answers to the questions? Yeah, thank you. Um, so the first question was about uh, how many permits are currently active right now. We have just over tw uh, 2,500 active permits. Um, and then we also anticipate uh, approximately another um, about 800 or so exemption, current exemption uh, that have been approved under the 2021 uh, cycle. Uh, you know, they would have priority in coming uh, into um, conformance with the new, with the new ordinance. <clears throat> um, so in terms of reapplying every year, um, permit holders would need to reapply every year. Um, so that was a question that that same um, the person asked, and so th there would be a renewal opportunity. It sounded like that first commenter was uh, perhaps a, a local uh, Tahoe resident. Uh, there is a provision under the ordinance that would uh, basically exempt those folks from the cap. They would still have to come in for a permit, um, but they would not be subject to the, to the uh, numerical cap of 3,900. So I just wanted to make that point clear. Um, and then did you, um, there was a question about tracking long-term rentals. I think with the adap uh, adaptation, you know, the, the management piece of it, the goal is to track um, that, that type of metric. So we would be looking at um, uh, tracking long-term rentals um, as well as new housing units that come online um, and hotel units that come online as well. And then I think that, did you have any other questions? I don't think there was any other questions. Yeah, I think that covers it. Can, uh, Crystal, can you share the phone number on the record if people have additional technical questions like these? Do you know the number to call? I do Your know direct that. line? <laughs> uh, they could call just our, our CEDRA number, which is 530-581-6200, um, 530 and we could direct them to the STR. I don't it, have the that's STR okay. hotline. It, in, is in on, it is on the website, and if people have further questions on the implementation, they can get Correct. answers to those questions. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Well, hearing the public comment today uh, and uh, all of the work we did at the last meeting, I'd like to make a motion to adopt the ordinance to repeal and replace Chapter 9, Article 9.42 of the Placer County Code to regulate short-term vacation rentals. Second. A second from Wygant. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Any abstentions? Okay. So that completes our open session today. Uh, we're now going to adjourn to closed session. County Council? The board will now adjourn to closed session to consider two items of existing litigation. Thank you, Karen. Would you report out of closed session? The board met in closed session to consider two items of litigation. In the matter of City of Lincoln versus County, the board heard a report and provided direction. In the matter of Freeborn versus County, the board heard a report and provided direction. This concludes the report out of closed session. Before we adjourn today, uh, we wanted to take a moment to recognize a county employee who is uh, leaving us. Today is his last board meeting. He didn't have a chance to come speak to us today on any items, so now would be the time. Mr. DeFonte. Took off my jacket and tie, and I'm here just in a shirt. Um, what do I say? I have really loved serving Placer County. I have loved serving all of you. I think you all know that. I think I've expressed that individually to each of you. Hopefully you know that. 
Um, I work with fantastic people here. You are well served by your CEO office. Um, some of those behind me. Um, yeah, just a great team. And uh, I hopefully take a lot of experience with me, what I've learned here. It's just a very well run county. I've, I think I've told many of you that you know I've worked in other places and um, I try to impart upon people here just how special this place is and how well it's run and how good they have it here because that's not always the case. So I, I hope they take that to heart. Um, again, I've really appreciated my time here and thank you for letting me serve you for the last five and a half years. Well, I'm sure some of us want to say something, but I'm, I'm going to just say real quick, I'm glad you told them all not to go with you and to stay here because they do have it really well here and we want them all here. So anyway, I think Supervisor Gore, you have a light on? Just quickly, um, Dave, I want to say thank you. And especially because you, you took on some really challenging projects uh, with some other jurisdictions. And I really appreciate your leadership, your flexibility, your thoughtfulness um, as you approach challenges and problems. Um, I'm sorry to lose you. Um, the other jurisdiction will be fortunate to have you. Um, but I just want to say thank you really for all of your hard work. Um, it's very much appreciated because you've helped us actually accomplish some things the last couple of years that weren't easy to get accomplished. Thank you. Supervisor Holmes? Yeah, I have to agree with uh, Supervisor Gore. Uh, I always appreciated you uh, just down the hallway. I pop in, do the pop in, and get uh, <laughs> some therapy, but uh, get some insight, and then our, our uh, monthly meetings where all the projects you're working on uh, really keep me informed. So uh, really gonna miss you. Uh, and I uh, hope you uh, do well as you move on, move on your career. Thank, thank you. you. Supervisor Jones. Yes, Dave, just want to thank you for helping me get up to speed in my first year. Um, sorry we won't be working together longer, but I'm sure your promotion is well deserved. Best of luck to you. Thank you. And Supervisor Wygant. Dave, it's been great serving with you. Really appreciate a lot of the work that you did and the progress you brought forward in certain areas. Um, and I hope you come back soon. <laughs> <laughs> Likewise. <laughs> oh, that was quick. That was very quick. Not as quick as we can be today. Yeah. Todd, did you want to say a few words? Yeah. Uh, um, Dave, I'm just sorry I couldn't be there. Um, but I just want to tell you, hey, you're, you've just been such an amazing asset, both to myself and I think the organization, and, and you're just a big loss. And I just wanted to say, hey, thanks for everything you've done, um, uh, not only for the organization, but I think the community as a whole. You've made, you made a tremendous difference and, and uh, be big shoes to fill, but I'm just uh, I'm really excited for you. And hopefully we can uh, cross paths here in the, in the near future, because there's a number of things I think we work together on regionally and and this will not be anything different so uh good to see you and i would echo the same sentiments as uh supervisor wygant um you may be back here um sometimes it's not always greener on the other side dave that's all i'm saying <laughs> so, congratulations thank you very Great. much thanks todd anyone else on okay Dave, I am going to miss you so much, and I just wanted to say thank you for always letting me drive to Tahoe by myself. <laughs> <laughs> You're very welcome. Anyone in the audience want to say anything? Jane? It goes without saying that Dave will be sorely missed. He um, was someone who helped me understand the culture and the oral traditions of Placer County when I got here. Um, and uh, he knows, as I've done at uh, prior farewells, and I hope you all can join us at the farewell for him at the station tomorrow, um, rather than long-winded, poignant remembrances, I tend to prefer pithy. Um, so for those of you that won't be there tomorrow night, I'll share this with you. Not sure what we'll do without Dave. For many a day did he save. For peers and for team, all live in the dream, wise counsel and humor he gave. And off now to sack does he go, so missed here at our CEO. Wish, wish him the best, his next planning quest, and sack, may you reap as you sow. Aww. Aww.
That's great, Jane. Um, anyone else? Oh, don't feel you. Okay. Well, Dave. Okay. Well, I'm sorry. I know I can't be there, but um, Dave, all our best to you and everything you did to help me as well uh, coming up to speed, especially on tax sharing agreements. <laughs> but, but you really did start to, um, I, I know you made a difference with our cities and, and really helping the county develop a stronger relationship of equity and fairness in those and explaining not only to a supervisor but to potentially city council members who needed to understand um, the complications of, of some of those items. So really uh, your manner and your approach um, is a, something that we just want to continue here with Placer County. So thank you for leaving us that and hope to see you really soon. Thank you. I think you're in good hands with my team. I think you uh, will be well served by Vanessa Lieberman and others uh, carrying that good work forward. So you're in great hands. Great. Thanks. Thank you. Anything else? Then we will adjourn for today. Thank you very much. Thank you.